Hey everyone, welcome to the next Chebcast. This is kind of a, a not so serious one because we're not discussing any really important topic or anything. We're pretty much just going through like the various undead and necromancy in, in books, TV, games, etc. And pretty much just saying whether we like it or not. And today we're here with It's Ghost UK. Hello. So hi for hentai. Yo. And we've got a special guest called Jinx. Pleasure to meet you. So how we're going to do this is we're going to be attempting to score these various things from favorite to worst. And I did my best to find as much as I could. And you guys also put some stuff down. But honestly, it was a bit of a challenge to find like necromancy stuff that I disliked. So the, the dislike list is kind of small. We'll make the, the most of what we've got here and we'll bloviate for the rest. And um, let's kick it off with the zombie apocalypse movies. Like, you know, just the the stereotypical stuff. Like there's uh, Just like every single zombie film ever. Yeah. Usually yeah. it's like a virus or fungi or whatever. How do you guys feel about that? Uh, well... I think it used to be the case wherein uh, it was one of those where it was cliche, but it was fun in the sense that, you know, it's the world is uh, a bit messed up. You can whip out a baseball bat, slap a brick on it and just go, you know, cave in some heads, go to a Tesco, steal some horse meat, stuff like that. Um, Like, I can't help but feel there was more sort of done in a way that, like, it makes it realistic and in that, oh yeah, the world is, you know, uh, messed up, we got zombies everywhere. How would you survive? Kind of thing. And most people would say, Oh, no, it would never happen like that. And then COVID happened, and now everybody would probably agree, Yeah, this is exactly how it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So before COVID, I would say, Yes, it's all right. And after COVID, I'm going to say, Yeah, this is every single zombie film is now a documentary. I'd say the well, the fact that there's uh, more parody zombie apocalypse films than serious zombie apocalypse films nowadays. I think mm-hmm. that is a pretty good indication as to how the genre has gone in the eyes of the public now. We're probably at the point where if, if humanity is wiped out through any other means, everyone's going to get really upset about it. It's like, oh, I was expecting... I, I, I had a bingo card for zombie apocalypse, and okay. Like, of all the ways you could go, I think zombie apocalypse is pretty cool. Mm. Well, you could believe the glory that way. How would, how would you guys go in the zombie apocalypse? Hmm. I, oh, I've already thought about this one. Living next to, you know, a whole bunch of castles, my first indication is to go to a castle and become basically a medieval knight I always wanted to be. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You even get to defend the realm from evil creatures. Basically, I become my own sort of monarch in my own little castle while the world goes around me. Hey, that's a good idea for a story i should write that down <laughs> yeah i was gonna say like you actually can do that as well because it's like oh how did you own this castle oh i got it for combat i i killed the previous people and now i've taken it by right of conquest fight me <laughs> yeah knowing me i'd probably uh, be one of the zombies oh most likely we yeah. all would be we all have this oh, yeah fantasy like, of oh we're gonna be great survivors now we'll most likely be the first to go <laughs> yeah, as, as, a, fa- as yeah. a fat guy like as a fat guy if you've ever seen the, like the first zombie land film you'll know i'm one of the first people to go <laughs> oh fuck i'm trying to think um i'm not too sure about exactly what i do in the zombie apocalypse probably my first goal though is is just like grab a fucking boat and just go over like one of those islands and like those fucking 50 million dollar houses next to each other and it's just like to be chilling there and see if there's any other fucking rich people there. One other people have the same idea though, so you'd be fighting over somebody's shoes. <laughs> I don't know. It's just probably like a huge fucking refugee camp or just I don't know, our own mini capitalism fucking place. Hmm. Um, I can't help but think that when it comes to those kind of films and that kind of media, the some of the best ones from that has got to be Left 4 Dead. Yeah, because of the different ways they go about it. Like, it's not just normal zombies. You've got the special ones as well, and you'll have like special ones in different media a- along with that. But it's Left 4 Dead for me feels like it's got like a kind of special place because of how they've gone about it. 
Like yeah. each of the each of the ones are distinct in terms of body type, noises, how they are, how they feel, so on and so forth. The actual story of Left for Dead is kind of tragic. Uh, the main characters are seemingly immune to the virus, but in actuality, it turns out that they are carriers rather mm. than they're immune. So everywhere they go, when people get infected and die, it's actually their fault. Oh, yeah. oh I remember that part. Yeah. Have you guys seen Shaun of the Dead? Yes. Ah. Yes, oh, that yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's basically it's a film where the zombies were already in it before the zombies even arrive. Yeah. yeah. Fuck. It's a great film. Mm. I love it when he flings that record and it like gets embedded in the zombie's head. Yeah, and then the filtering <laughs> through and the filtering through them as well. It's like, oh, do we do we toss this one? Eh, chuck it. <laughs> you know, kind of similar to the zombie apocalypse stuff is the day of the Triffids. You guys know about that? Yes. Yeah. See, the thing is, it's like they did like a remake of that um, some time ago, and I watched it, and I thought it was a bit eh, because I was thinking, I was thinking to myself, you know, like with, with Triffids, it's it's big plants, like it, with 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 you know we, we've got a society where most of our weapons use small explosives in order to actually function. How can how can trees take over? We've got flame for it. We've got people that. For, that we've got we've got accidental fights being started because trans people are a thing. Like just <laughs> like yeah. how can trees be threatening? And then and then they come out with like oh yeah, there's this great big uh, celestial event that goes like everyone's blind. Okay, now I can understand it, and everyone's fighting. Yeah, I can even understand it even more now. <laughs> yeah, let's um move along to the next one, Game of Thrones. <sighs> I'm a bit awkward with that one. Um, the so end, fucking clue. Cool. Uh, I was gonna say, what do you guys think first? Like, I've still not seen a single episode. Yeah, hey, same here. Yeah, all, <laughs> all I know is there's a lot of incest. Uh, yeah. there's some war in politics. Yep. Uh, things can get awkward. Uh, there's a lot of fucking titties. Yep. Uh, <laughs> there's also like these eyes, motherfuckers. Yep, very historically accurate. Or- yeah, north of the wall yeah. is uh, undead <laughs> necromancer. Uh, well, okay, so what it is, it's basically um, George R. R. Martin is t- has done, you know, the, have you ever heard of the Roar of the Roses? Yes. Uh, okay, he's basically take that, t- uh, took that and he's put dragons and shit in. And he's done it with that. Basically, the undead and uh, the undead and that are from ice, no, White Walkers. And in the books, they ride on the backs of giant spiders. But because uh, on the budget, they didn't really. It's on the budget. They didn't. Re- the the budget didn't cover giant sea giant spiders. And that and the directors probably didn't want it because it was too fantastical for them. Which is why they're doing a you know the fantasy series. <clears throat> I'm, so, I'm I'm not salty. I'm not salty. <laughs> I'm not salty. Mm. Fuck those two, seriously. They can go fuck themselves. Um, <laughs> the actual dead themselves, it's, they're good. They're good and they're not, I feel. So the way in which it works is that you'll have these ice demons that can only be destroyed with uh, uh, special stuff, uh, with, with plot devices. So one of them is uh, Dragon Glass Obsidian, which is ma- uh, which is a pa- which was apparently made by dragons, and there's a ton of it in one place. And it can they can only be killed with Valyrian Steel. Which is steel, it's like normal steel, but it's not, because it's special steel, because it's got the word Valyrian in front of it. Armor steel. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but no, the way that the undead work is that in that, um, the White Walkers are able to reanimate them, but the way that they do it, it's not like, there's no big, great special effects. It's literally just, they do a motion with their hands, and they, anything that's stood around them comes alive, like, you know, reanimates. In that one scene with the Night King, I believe the guy's name is, just the yeah. one where he looks upon the enemies and then just raises his hand and everyone comes up. Now that's a cool depiction. Yeah, yeah. And it's and that's that's what works really, really well with them. It's like they don't really talk, but what they've got is that they've just got it's interesting, because I always saw that uh that one scene alone and it always made me think, huh, that would be a really interesting series. I'd really like to watch that if it's all like that and then turns out that's like very small plot point. Yeah, it's because yeah. it's because the fucking di- uh, the directors didn't want to do like a proper fantasy fantasy uh, fantasy series, which is which is exactly why it's got magic in and dragons and undead and all of that. So what do you think? Those two, like those two can always go fuck themselves. Uh, what? Yeah. Between like, 
uh, one. And seven. I'd say five. I'd say five, and I'd say five because it doesn't have as much. Like they could, they could have done so many different things with it. Because with how White Walkers are, they are efficient, so they could have done so many. Like they could have gone in so many different directions. And I've said this multiple times. It's why don't they experiment on them? Why don't they? Um, expand on what they've already got and do more but the thing is is that they don't really need to because the ones that they've got already uh the zombies that can the zombies that can run around they're very hard to kill and that's just it they don't eat they don't sleep they pretty much don't get tired they just run they just run at something until it's dead and then they'll just move on to the next thing and then the thing that they've just killed will be the working with them so there's that but but the thing is is that when it comes to the undead is I guess typically when it comes to undead, they need a fair bit of diversity. They need to kind of have uh, be expanded on because normally in fantasy, there are other things to take them out. Like say, for example, in um, I was going to bring up a different one, but like that can always be the next point. Um, Let's say, for example, you've got like uh, an army of 5,000 zombies. Normally, if the opposition's got nothing that can go against that, you're you're most likely going to win because you've got you've got 5000 zombies they have to take into account uh, things like rations food they've got they've got to rest and sleep they've got to take into into account the weather they've got to take into account the structures and uh, defenses and all of that you don't have to worry about any of that if they've got magic you have to be really careful around it and it's like you can see this with the series as well because when dragons get uh, start mowing down uh, the undead they they take a normal threat they take something that is incredibly terrifying and they make it seem rather simplistic because You've got flying dragons that can spew fire from their mouths. What can they do against that? Raise an undead dragon, clearly. <laughs> well, yeah, that's yeah, that's what they do. But that's that's the thing because they need uh, the the Night King himself does that, and he has to personally do it. Okay. I'd- so and he misses he misses a few times. He gets it in the end, but it's yeah. I'd probably rate it a four for like just okay. I don't think it's the best or, or the worst. I, I think it's just. It's all right. Mm. What about? Yeah, I can't really rate it too highly. It's like, yeah, they have like some cool, like, uh, like weird political stuff going around. But it's like, I feel like I haven't even really, really uh, watched them. But that might be harder to follow. At times, not to mention, uh, there could like be like strange variety of scenes of like like an intense battle and it's just like a just random fucking sensual sex scene. Oh. And then uh, there's also like you know the the kind of inconsistency about how they kind of do like pretty much their like, pacing throughout. As well as their fucking ending was weird, and you know, last yeah, like, like, it's but, because like, it, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. The, the ending was weird because like they try to do their own ending because the books didn't really follow up to that point, right? Mm. Yeah. It's what well, it is. Is when it comes to uh, Dumb and Dumber, um, they're good with adapting stuff that is already existing, right? When it comes to making their own stuff. The shit at it, and you can see this with with uh, their you know uh, their ideas for uh, <laughs> yeah, the <sorry. laughs> uh, ideas for different series and whatnot. And uh, I say that, it, and the reason why I say that is because they pitched one called Confederate, not very good, mainly because we're actually seeing that in real life. If yeah, it's bas- it's basically what would happen if. Um, the you know this you know the American Civil War. It's if the wrong people won it. Oh yeah, yeah. So and what would happen like modern day, but with that, which could be good, but it mm, it's a bit no. Fuck that. Another thing that pisses me off about it is the terrible battle tactics which they use in those movies. Like mm. basically just zero tactics. Just everyone run, swarm at the wall, get killed. It's like what the fuck. The thing the thing with that is. There is some slight accuracy there because when it comes to sieges, depending on how you do the siege, you can lo- you can lose up to three times the amount of people that the defenders have. Like you'd be throwing bodies at the wall with ladders and everything, and the defenders would have built these castles and these strongholds to withstand sieges. They would have built them to be practical and to be effective. So taking them would would incur heavy losses. Yet it's with some with some of them like you can tell you can tell that at so, at some points they just have no like uh, the one i think it was the battle uh, wherein Tyrion is defending king's landing from stannis and i think it was the case wherein uh, george rr R. martin was working on that with them to make it really quite good 
but and that was quite nice but when it comes to when it comes to the one at the end where it's pitch black so you can't see shit and then they've got trebuchet uh, they've got catapults and trebuchet trebuchets outside the castle yeah, launching one fucking <laughs> one fucking volley of artillery right and and it looks all nice and, and clever and all of that and and they do, they do it just once or twice and then everyone just does fuck all and just waits for the dead like just fuck off <laughs> Right. Fuck off, you! What's the fucking just? Just fuck off. I hope the two of it, like if I'm I'm one I'm one of those where in if you fuck up, just admit it, move on. You can be a better person. But with those two, with the amount of people that they got invested into this show, and the, and like you have fucking people naming their kids after the fucking characters, and then they take a massive steaming shit at the end because they wanted to fuck off and do Star Wars, and then Star Wars fucked them off because they realised how shit they were. So then they went over to fucking Netflix and they've done fuck all since then. Uh, yeah, we need to move on. I'm just getting a bit too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's like, dude. like, real with that. It, it, uh, it, you know, it's bad when even goddamn Star Wars tells you off. <laughs> oh fuck! Yeah, it's yeah. It's I, I can't help but think that they del- that they wanted to rush it to move on to Star Wars, and with all of that fucking con- uh, controversy kicking off, controversy, ki- whatever the fuck it's called, kicking off, the people are start like Disney just looked at them and said. Shit, we've made it. We've made a fucking decision, haven't we? Um, okay, well, we'll take them on and see how they are. And then fast forward, and then the two of them. Yeah, we have decided that we're going to leave Star Wars um, of our own volition, of course, and go into something else because we're going to save face and uh, suck each other off. Oh god! All right, let's oh. move on to Doctor Who. Yes. Uh, what undead is in Doctor Who? Because I know that there's some. I'm just trying to because I'm trying to remember because I've seen. Quite. I stopped watching it after Matt Smith. So there's two uh, main depictions. The, there's one that uh, I thought I'd talk about in specific because it was an interesting idea. But there's one I literally just thought about that kind of makes sense. But I'd not talk about so much because it's from one of the most recent series. And oh. it's uh, yeah, like to basically uh, take a very long story short. Uh, this doctor's version of the master uh reanim- okay this is going to sound really strange reanimates time lords using cyberman technology to create undead robot time lords that can regenerate as soon as they're killed and thus can get up no matter how many times they're killed it sounds insane but the thing that makes it a bit silly is that he plans to take over the universe using this incredible fight- fighting force, but he's only got ten of them. <laughs> so, yeah. It's like, it's I just like, I like I like how that's the silliest thing, and not okay. So, it's dead flesh. It's dead matter that can somehow regenerate. Uh, yeah, it's something to do with the fact that he's got a liquid form of the Cyberman technology in them, and thus it could bring them back to life. It's so weird and complicated and stupid that I... Why, yeah. why is the Master not using this to solve world hunger? Like, he could literally dominate every market across the universe by selling mystery meat. Because he's crazy! Is basically what it's going to be. But the other depiction, and the far more interesting one, is act. Is what? Oh, we've lost him. He's oh, gone. He died. He's dead, Jim. He's gone. Oh, great. Someone start the ritual of reanimation. <laughs> right, I'll get the torches, oh. you get the goat. Have I reanimated? Am I alive? Yes, you're, you're back. Ah, okay. shit. He's got the Cyberman uh, space juice inside <laughs> his veins. He's ah, shit. He looks like space Jason Voorhees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the other interesting depiction is actually quite early on from the rebooted series. Um, it's from the first series, episode three, The Unquiet Dead. And it's uh, an alien race called the Gelf. And essentially, the episode is set in, um, I believe it's Victorian London. Um, the Gelf, and... not not to be. Yes, the Gelf. G E no G H E L F. Yes, not M I. Right, okay then. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's, and... that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're essentially they're uh, a gaseous race, um, based oh on based on. Uh, having no physical form and 
after after a big war, they decided to escape through uh, a dimensional portal, and this dimensional portal ended up on Earth, as of oh, course they seemingly this, do. Is this the episode? Is this the episode where that fucking guy runs around the house, turning on like all of the fucking gas lights so they explode the house? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> that, that, that one. Oh, okay. Then. So, like, um, they essentially, they can't interact with anything because they have no physical bodies. So, so they, they take out, yeah. They start possessing dead bodies because they, it just so happens the place they ended up in was a mortuary. And so they start possessing the dead bodies and thus they start walking around in dead bodies as zombies. How incredibly uh, convenient that they were round up in a mortuary. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so uh, they walk around in dead bodies, and then, of course, main character finds out about it, finds out everything about it to do with alien race. And I think the reason why I po- like I talked about it beforehand as being an interesting depiction is that the, the main the the moral quandary of it is essentially they then ask the human race if they can then possess all of their dead bodies so their race can survive again. And I see no problem with that. Yeah. That, and, you know, the funniest thing is the doctor, the, the, the beacon of moral goodness and all that, also does not see a problem with this. He literally calls it recycling. <laughs> and uh, then, of course, uh, has to become a Doctor Who episode, and thus ruin the depiction of it. So Yeah, because it's back in time, so if they do that, then they've got to rewrite the entire course of human history <laughs> after that point. Yeah. Yes. So instead, they decided to turn them into Monster of the Hour by making it so that, oh, we don't actually want to possess all the dead bodies, we want to possess all the alive ones as well! We're actually evil! And, Bruh. yeah, I don't understand why they well, suddenly turned evil. I'm just, I'm just picturing it. Uh, possessing Ugh. a living body seems so fucking stupid. Like, if the person's still alive, that means if they get shot up or anything like that, there's actual chances of it messing up. If you possess a, possess a dead body, there's, like, nothing wrong gonna happen. Yeah, it was a, a silly move, but they basically Unless- just wanted to make them a villain for no reason. Unless it's Wonder Woman, in which case somebody can possess a, another body at the end of the film without any issue oh, at God. all. And, and, and the case of consent doesn't matter because, you know... <laughs> Um, <laughs> I was, I'm just picturing that. It's like I uh, just I just imagine like this girl there going, "Ma'am, Grandma's in the garden again. She's talking to the stars." Uh, so, what do you guys rate that? I think it's okay. I'd sort of put it as a, a sort of okay depiction. Like the concept is really interesting: an alien race with no ability to exist for themselves. You <laughs> You just use dead bodies as a way see, to live. See, That's- the funny thing is, there's actually another race uh, that does something similar to this that was designed, like, what, 100, 200 years ago? Something like that? It's, Love- it's, Lo- it's a Lovecraftian race, right? Uh, in the Lovecraft mythos called called the Great Race of Yif. Calm down, furries. Um, uh, uh, Y-I-T-H. Just, just, just... If somebody, if somebody's doing the subtitles for this, just please, you know, just... <laughs> so... The idea is that they can, I think it was the case where they can see the future, they can see their own demise coming. So what they do is that they pick a race that they are going to body swap with, and they will take select individuals, or certain individuals, or like random people, and they will body swap with them. So the, so the so with humanity, for example, a human will occupy a Yif's body, and like analyze and like you know just to sort of be a bit oh shit well what's this i've got claws i've i've got i've got noise organs my eyes are, are bulging at you know like that why all the if experiments with the human body like you know just sort of checks the organ or well, not checks the organs but sees what they're like you know how they feel so on and so forth come in and what they do and what they do is they swap their consciousness over over an entire of their entire race. So their entire race will, will go over to the human bodies, and the human bodies will occupy the Yif bodies. So when the Yif are killed, it's basically ending um, not just their race, but well, it's it's ending their bodies with human minds inside of them. The race technically survives just on a different planet, on a different body, and they will do the exact same thing. A- Again, they'll just uh, they'll develop it because they've got all of this information, all of this knowledge. They will probably develop human society to be a certain way and what they're comfortable with. 
they will foresee the future, see when they're going, see when humanity is going to be destroyed, and then they will um, plan to move on with that. Right. And that makes up the question, though, like, is like the b- previous body their original body, or like there's some sort of like concept like a long time ago, but they just forgot? I'm not sure if they actually go into that because I think it's a case wherein I'm going to put a picture in uh, to of one because I think it's the case where when it comes to them, the one that's shown I don't think is the original one. Oh, hello, handsome. <laughs> so, oh, shit. so and because of how look, and because I... of how. And because of how like Lovecraftian it is, it's going to be if there's a still a great element of the unknown. So you're not really going to know if this is the original or if this is one that's been taken on or so on and so forth. Because mm-hmm. they probably won't even know themselves. All right, let's move on to the next one. So now we're heading into the books territory. Mm-hmm. Kick this off with oh, a no. British book called Necroscope. Have you guys heard of it? Nope. Go on. Nope. Basically, it's a book about um, the Cold War, but they've added like necromancy and stuff in. So you've got. Oh no! Yeah, you've. It's it's actually good, but you've. So Call of Duty them. introduces um, Nazi zombies, and Necroscope introduces Soviet zombies. <laughs> it's it's kind it's, of like this, but basically, that they've got like the the Soviets have their own like uh, occult wing, and so mm. British. Oh yeah, yeah, I know what you're on about. Yeah, and like the the Soviets have necromancers, and what they do is they like um, they like take a corpse and they like rifle through it and like eat the organs and stuff, and from that they can learn the the memories of that corpse. And uh, the uh, British have another kind of necromancer called um, Harry Co, and this guy can just like talk to the dead, and he's like the the pro- the protagonist. And anyway, like the the thing is that over in the east, there's this ancient vampire called um i'm trying to think up the the name now i don't recall anyway he's um living in like the ground and how these vampires work in necroscope is that they're like a parasite so they they have an egg and they implant it into a human and then that human becomes like uh at first it's like they kind of share the same body but over time it becomes more and more that the human gets pushed out and the vampire takes complete control and it, the, the vampires have all kinds of weird powers like they can um they can like make sort of lesser copies of themselves so wait 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 wait. so an egg is being inserted into a person yep right and the egg is controlling the person it grows to control them Right, so it's not like a parasite inside that comes out of the egg and goes to the brain it's, it's like the egg itself is growing in size and controls well what happens is, is the egg goes inside the human through the skin it like it's absorbed through and then, oh right right okay and then it finds its way to like the spinal column and it kind of like merges with the nervous system and then mm. from there it like yeah yeah it's it's like yeah it's, it's like a mushroom fungus sort of yeah kind of uh, it's like uh, cord- I mean the cordyceps is like to do that with, but it's with ants it's, well it's with, it's with the race it's tiered towards uh, uh, species it's tiered towards and it's with the brain yeah and anyway like these these vampires can make lesser copies of themselves and these are like they're kind of like thralls and yeah mm-hmm. I think it's a pretty cool like it's a cool story from the vampire perspective but you know like Harry Co always wins and I find that a drag but right at the end, he like summons all these like zombies and stuff, which is pretty interesting. But yeah. Okay. When uh, when was it done? Do you know? These books were written by Brian Lumley in the nineties, I think. Ah, uh, that explains why then. Yeah. Yeah. So the necromancy that's depicted is a lot more closer to the uh, real life old applications of necromancy rather than raising undead armies. It's more about contacting the dead. Yes. Mm. Yeah. I found that quite a bit when trying to find like good necromancy books and shit. Like it's it's a bit going through them, and it would be sort of more sort of historically uh, mythologically accurate ones. I'm going to talk to my dead ancestors. How? Well, simple. There's this heart right here, and I'm going to munch on it. <laughs> I actually did some research on that myself, and it turns out that like 
back in the day uh, when necromancy was considered a real thing for just talking to your ancestors or spirits, everyone was able to do it. And like they even showed like noble warriors, the kind of things you'd imagine paladins would be if they existed to be doing the exact same thing. They stay in their war tent before the battle begins and they try and contact spirits that are nearby in order to try and figure out how best to do the battle ahead. It's an interesting that depiction. Be, that would be absolutely... Inc- like, imagine a typical sort of holy kind of paladin just doing that. Like, and it's not even, like, it would probably be seen... Like, it's, it's going to be, like, you know, how did they get the hull? How did they get the organs? But, I mean, if they go about it in a sort of legitimate way or, like, a pleasant way, then... Or a so a way that gives them the moral justification <laughs> for doing it, and I can see that working really, really well. I'm actually tempted to do that with some of my own stuff now. Yeah, I think the best necroscope book is probably the second one because it it's really quite sort of like dark and evil, and I quite like that. But mm. it, it, wow, there's like eighteen books. Yeah. Oh my god! I've only read the first three, but I enjoyed them. 18? I think it's a... I'd say it's an okay <laughs> necromancy. Like, if I had to rate it. If, if it's okay Jesus and there's 18 Christ. books, I'm not going to really go read all that, because what the fuck? <laughs> no. Necroscope Avengers. <laughs> Just oh say God. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it reminds me of, like, the, the, it reminds me of, like, the Marvel Zombies one. Oh, I've just... Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, zombies? Yeah, it's oh, Sp- Spider Man as a zombie. Oh wow, it, that's a that's a whole topic you, in itself. Do you, want, do you want to do it, or should I? Do you want to do it, or should I do it? Uh, you, uh, go ahead, have fun trying to. Try, uh, I'm, 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 taking, I'm, taking off my, I'm taking off my glasses for this. I'm just going to put them on the side. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, I'm, ta- and I'm, ta- like, I'm taking off my glasses, like you, you know, you know, in in um ash Ketchum, like does his cat back or in the film where the glasses come off so the person can properly like look at someone right <sighs> it's, a, it's a stupid thing i'm being a weeb so anyway okay. <clears throat> no no the we would be like readjust your glasses and it'd be uh just be catching the fucking sunlight so no one can see your eyes that's be the weeb yeah, thing. We're, 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 we're push, push his glasses up with middle finger oh this is yep. my final form <laughs> <laughs> How so, did you duck my planet? I almost killed you. It's like, it push up glasses. Well, simple, really. Okay, so the way it works is it basically it's the time loop. Um, spoilers for anyone who wants to read it. I probably should have said that before. Yeah. Spoilers for anyone who wants to read it. It's basically a time loop. There we go. Um, <laughs> uh, so you've got Ash from the Evil Dead. Evil Dead having quite good undead from what I've seen, given how comical and how much personality that they've got. Um, uh, basically, he goes to the Marvel world, and I think he's trying to alert everyone else as to something that's coming or whatnot, um, as he does. And then you've got undeads that are coming in, and it's an infection that's kind of spreading. So it's sort of like, like one person that will bite another person, that person when this infection becomes an, an undead. But the way it works is that they'll be undead, but they'll still be intelligent. They'll just have this absolutely ravenous hunger the for human flesh that they must satiate so and they late it's later explained or it's later implied uh that it's this is actually all mental they they with them being dead they have no bodily functions they don't need to eat rather it's just a mental um addiction that they've got that they can't like you like there's a there's a guy who's just a head who it's who is adamant like he he needs to eat something but he's got no stomach so yeah um but the but the way it works is that you've got like these zombies that are going around you got all like the, all the avengers and heroes being involved and whatnot um now normally this would be contained and ash uh, is trying to stop them he later gets c- killed and eaten by howard the duck let me actually find a picture of that. Yeah, I was about to say, I'm not sure how Ash would survive since he's just a, literally just a normal person, but has a chainsaw arm and a shotgun. <laughs> yeah. It's like, a- I don't know I don't know why they have a crossover in Avengers in the first place. It's like, okay, cool. We have a guy throwing a building. Guy with a chainsaw arm. Try to win. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the image. It's, uh, you know, it tastes like chicken, like most things, um, as you do. So... Yeah, it would be it would be easily contained, and they explain that it would be easily contained. But uh, Quicksilver got infected, 
And uh, I think it was the case where Mystique got infected, so then she turned into someone that Quicksilver was trying to save. So then she bit Quicksilver, and Quicksilver, using his super speed, bit everyone across every continent and island in the world. Yeah. So, for some fucking reason, because I know I know that you can be hungry, but still, like, you know, there's, there's running down the street to go get some Mackies, and then there's running literally to fucking Japan to bite someone. As you do. So then, it, <laughs> so, so then, so then it becomes a global pandemic. <clears throat> um, <laughs> oh, the pandemics again. Yeah. So then becomes so then it becomes a, a global issue, and all of the superheroes are getting infected as well. And then the problem is, is that they're still really, really strong. And with them being superheroes, they all have plot armor. So there's not really much anything to do. Anyway, so a bunch of people die. I think a bunch of like uh, a bunch of heroes and villains die. A bunch of heroes get infected. A bunch of villains get infected. Uh, then Galactus shows up. So then they all. So then Galactus gets fucking eaten. And then people that eat. And then those that eat him get the the power cosmic because they've just eaten fucking Galactus. <laughs> so then how the- you eat him in the first place? They, uh, like the product, like, a fucking straw. Like he's made a fucking. <laughs> So, so then, because they've got the power cosmic and most people on Earth are dead, uh, what they do is they decide, you know what, we're, we're, we're like godly beings now, why don't we go around the galaxy and eat everything? So then they fuck off and start, and start going on a massive munchies binge around the galaxy. So you'll have it like, oh, it's a nice idyllic uh, alien world with alien people chilling out, and then suddenly uh, Marvel Zombies Avengers shows up. <laughs> POV, you are a Tyranid. So then, and then fast forward, and they end up eating everyone. Earth is pretty much a dead world with only a couple survivors left. Um, there are zombies that have gotten over their addiction, but uh, like over their need to eat. But to do this, they've had to basically be put in quarantine um, and to be left alone for an extended period of time while they get over it. Now, the problem with this is that the more powerful ones can't do this because how can you build something to contain the Hulk? So, anyway, so the, the Avengers finish basically uh, infecting and eating um, Ego. Isn't that his name, Ego? The, the planet? The living planet, yeah, Ego. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so then, let me let me get a picture of that. So then... I'm also not sure how you make Hulk into an undead, considering that, like, I think there are times where he just came back to life, and, like, there's been certain depictions of him literally having just, like, the power of life at his side. So I'm not sure how you can turn that head ass into just a zombie. It feels oh, there's, like. a, there's, there's a lot of uh, questions surrounding this canon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, like, like one of them has uh, Magneto blaming himself just for some reason, despite him having nothing to do with this. And it's that plot point is never addressed later on. Mm. So you've got that. So then they basically just have the munchies on ego, and then they realize that they've basically killed everything and eaten everything in the galaxy, and there's fuck all else to eat. So what do they do? They go back to Earth because someone has a multiverse portal thing that they can use to infect every multiverse ever, but also to eat everything in the multiverse. So, you know, they don't really have to worry too much with that. And oh yeah, also Hulk has changed, so instead of getting angry, uh, turning when he get uh, when Bruce gets angry, he instead turns when he gets hungry. Which later bites him in the ass because when uh, Hulk kills like uh, some people that had survived all of this time, um, he yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but we're at forty minutes. I think Marvel Zombies has just taken up most of that. <laughs> <laughs> just... so, so, I'll, I'll wrap it up. I'll wrap it up. So yeah. so. So Hulk eats some people that have been surviving all this time. So then he goes back to Banner, and then Banner's like, "Okay, just please kill, kill me, just off me, just put a gun, to me. just just do it. I'll, I'll, hey, where's the gun? I'll do it myself." So he dies. Then um, they go. So then they go to a new world. I think Spider-Man goes to a new world, and he ends up killing or eating somebody or whatnot. So then Sandman sees him do this, and is really you know upset and kind of uh, disappointed. So then Sandman ends up killing the real Spider-Man by basically voiding himself into Spider-Man's mouth and then exploding uh, Spider-Man's bulging fat body. There'd be some kink stuff going on there if it wasn't so fucked. <laughs> oh, Christ. Well, that was a thing that happened. <laughs> yeah, and then, it, and then it sort of goes back to how it started, I think, wherein like, a bunch of shit happens and then Ash goes to heaven, and then he ends up going back to the Marvel uh, world where he was in an, at the start. And it get yeah, it's very convoluted. 
Yeah, one last thing. I'm not sure whether there's like actual zombies in the first place. Like, if you actually seen the actual versus the dead movie, it's pretty much like it's pretty much like all demons doing their own weird aren't bullshit. They, aren't they called demon deadites? Movies. Deadites. There we go. Yeah, but it's yeah. also like demons also show up like the fucking like uh, Netflix series where it's called. And it's just like the dead eyes just do fuck all. It's not really that they infect someone. It's just more like if a dead eye kills someone, like like completely kills someone, uh, then they can get infected. Is not infected. It's hard to describe. It's like they can also become dead eyes themselves, but also in only certain occasions. Sometimes they may not just to turn at all. Sometimes they just stay like just, just stay dead. It's a weird fucking thing. Right. But just know that they're like, they're not just like normal zombies. They're, they're, they become like super fucking strong for no reason. Right, mm. Let's move on, guys. Indeed. Um, would World of Warcraft have good depictions of undead? I mean, it has Artas, who is probably the most interesting kind of lich I could think of off the top of my head, considering he kind of... Oh, uh, who? Again. Uh, the Lich King. Oh, uh, is he actually? Like, I don't think he's actually a Lich though. Like he is the Lich King, but it, no, he's not yeah, yeah, no, he's just like he's just a normal fucker who has like a special helmet on. <laughs> yeah, like the helmet has a soul inside it. Like it's got the the soul of an orc inside it. Um, that orc being Nezul. Yeah. Who and since and considering how Zul is actually a character. He actually hasn't been Nizzle in his, in his entire life. So, the I more th- you know. I think Warcraft has, like, decent um, mm. necromancy, but it's really been sidelined, in my opinion. Like, they don't really... Yeah. That, no. Like, in Warcraft 3... Um, in Warcraft <sighs> 3... You're right. Ah, yes. Did you find more Cyberman juice? <laughs> Apparently I pulled out my cable, of oh. course. Oh, no. Um, but yeah, when it comes when it comes to like um, WoW's undead, I do quite like how they do. Like they've got quite a cartoony way of going. About, like it, let's have a look at some of the art. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the, the cartoony stuff. I'm just happy that Artas is just not another old guy who wields a staff and is invincible and is. He's got an interesting yeah. character arc from being the most paladin of all paladins to becoming leader of the undead hordes. That's yeah. just an, that's an interesting kind of, and it's it's believable because he did he was doing everything he could to protect his people, and then from there it just sort of spiraled into getting worse and worse until he eventually became the Lich King through kind of possession. It's it's a complicated kind of story to try and tell in a very short yeah. amount of time. Yeah. Um, I don't like that kind of art somehow. I don't know why exactly. You overly caught it. Like, is it because it kind of dumbs down the undead sort of? It's kind of like it feels. It's hard to take seriously. Yeah, I'd say it just looks I a bit too monstery. Yeah, I think it's not because of that. I don't think it's because of the fact that like it's supposed to be undead, not a monster. It's like you take a normal human skeleton, you normal human body, and out pops that. That would be fucking weird. Yeah, it doesn't look like a human. Like, yeah, it does not look like human at all. It's more like just someone turning a goblin into undead. That I can more or less believe, but no, that's supposed to be a like, person. It looks like someone reanimated Abe from Abe's Odyssey. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm like... <laughs> Is that Oddworld? Yes. yes. <laughs> see, I think I've seen like a, a trailer or two for that. I've not actually. Is it any good? Because I've only heard good things about it. It's a great game. Oddworld's mm. lovely. It's a bit difficult to understand initially when you're getting through because it's a very odd game, but it's a wonderful game. I actually know someone who worked on the original and is mate work king on stuff now and is a lovely guy, but mm. they're very passionate about their games. Sure. Is it on Steam? I don't know, actually. That's a good question. I think they made some... Oh, shit, it is. Yeah. Oh, they've got a lot, actually. Holy... Okay, then. Huh. That's like a 90s PlayStation game. Two pounds, buy it! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. I don't like the World of Warcraft art so much somehow. I, I just don't like it. 
Yeah, it's. I mean, it's not to like. I guess when it comes to the, how, how do I say it? I've got I've, I've got a lot of issues with WoW at the minute, and I've, and like I've been playing on and off since Wrath, uh, Wrath of the Lich King, but it's. The, the thing with it is that um, there was originally going to be doing a Warhammer game, but then the deal fell through, so they, they decided, you know what, we're just going to fucking do our own and just take some quote-unquote inspiration. Well, that's what I was going to go on to and ask, what do you feel about Warhammer's depiction of undead? Because I feel like it's it's very classical, so, mm-hmm. you know, it's got a lot of the classic tropes. You've got your oh, skeletons, that's... you've got your zombies, but it also has some interesting depictions of certain undead. For example, the fact that there are vampiric creatures, not just vampires, so mm. Terrorgeist and Vargeist, which all take inspiration from bats, which I found is quite a fascinating way to look at undead. Yeah. But for me, I'd say the the strength of Warhammer's undead depictions are usually from the characters. But it's kind of half and half, because most necromancers and undead in the Warhammer universe are considered evil and they're just evil for the sake of power or yeah. other such similar things. The, like one, not... uh, go on. the one that I could think of um, off the top of my head who I would consider to be actually one of the best depictions, obviously there is Nagash who is really yeah. cool looking and very imposing, but I think he's just typical evil necromancer lich, which is like I like the power level, but the depiction is not very relatable. If that makes sense. Mm. Um, is a picture of Nagash. I think yes. his rise to power is great, but the end result maybe not so much. Yes, the fact his is basically his like origins and how he became the one that he was is very interesting, and also he's one of the most powerful undead ever depicted in I mean, existence, which I think hat. is great. That hat is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've thought about myself a few times when I've been looking at el- like elf helmets. Like I was thinking to myself, am, am I on all four and like guiding some elves, or or is this the KKK? Like what what is this? That ass is looking like a tomb king. <laughs> um, it's, just, it's the same. It's the same with the goblin hat. It's just fucking why. Um, but when it comes to like more interesting depictions of undead, I'd actually say one of the most interesting for me is a character called Helman Gorst. Oh, um, him! Isn't he? Isn't he just a foot? Like when it when it comes when it comes to Warhammer, um, when it comes to like Warhammer undead and some of the characters, it feels it's really stupid at times and really kind of over the top. But the thing is, is that that's one of the things that Warhammer so good. Yes, yeah, grim, dark all the way. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's it's like it, it's it's never it's never sort of it's never this or that. It's one of the case where Helman Ghost, my brothers pull this, my dead brothers pull this fucking garage. Why? Because I wanted to be with them all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think that his origin it makes him more interesting than what he became. Again, a bit like Nagash, actually, where Hellman was initially just a uh, Star Wars. A, 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 a cu- it was a courier um, mm. that worked within the Empire, and then the plagues came, and he came back to his home city and found his entire family, including his brothers and his father, dead. Being very upset, he then decides to take the natural option, of course, and look up how to use necromancy to bring them back. And that brings the attention of the witch hunters, which then drive him out the city. And then from there, he actually turns out to be really good at necromancy. And so the vampire counts take him in, and he becomes their sort of chief necromancer. And See, now he has them pulling a cart that he rides like a chariot. Mm. See, this is this is sort of what kind of gets me a bit when it comes to um, powerful necromancer types. Because in fantasy, there seems to be sort of a theme wherein, when it comes to the characters rising to power, there tends to be a thing of um, experiencing loss or death in life, and through love, wanting to bring that, uh, wanting to bring these people back. Which then leads onto uh, a dark path, which then leads into conflict when people try to stop this person from doing it, and this person ends up being discriminated, which then drives them further down this path. To like, it's it's in a way, in a way, it's not so much one of those we're in. Is, is it, I guess it's kind of similar to um, kind of extremism or mental health issues in a way. In a sense, and uh, now you may be think, thinking, oh, how can he draw this parallel? Well, it's. In, if these people could, if like if these necromancers sort of had somebody there to kind of guide them through it, and like, oh, you know, we're here if you need anything, kind of, kind of jobby, or if they had proper support, 
then they wouldn't have been driven or ostracized to, to feel that they need to do this. Because then they wouldn't have been driven down that path. Like, if, if Ghost had the, the proper people there with him, he wouldn't have met the he wouldn't have met the vampire cats. He wouldn't have, you know, become an acromancer and been doing all of this. Like, I've got I've got similar stuff in my own world, and I feel like that's, that's quite a common thing, I guess, when it comes to stuff like that. I'd say that even though it might be overdone, I'd say it's effective because it pulls mm. on the real human hearts that would read or experience this media. Like, we've most likely, all of us, all experienced loss at some point in our life. And even if it was just for a second, we've just briefly thought to ourselves, oh, I would do anything just to see them again. And the whole necromancy being created by going down that dark path is essentially taking that one desperate thought and clinging on to it because desperation and delirium has essentially taken a hold of you. Mm. So I'd say it's quite effective with that, but you are right in that it's quite overdone. Yeah. It's, uh, I guess it's one of those where it's over, like, you know, tropes are tropes for a reason. It's one of those where it's overdone because it's effective and it does work. It does tug at the heart. Like, you you will have people that will have uh, a loved one that loved one that dies, and every single day they will go, they will miss that person and think of them. And if you could bring them back, why wouldn't you? Yeah, especially when you can bring them back as a nice rotten zombie, like why would the best yeah. kind? <laughs> yeah, jawbone not included, sold separately. <laughs> yeah, who needs a jawbone anyway? <laughs> All right, I've got a question. Sorry, Jinx. Um, All right. Which books can I read to learn about um, Herman Gorst? Um, I believe the the one... Uh, this is going to sound a bit unfortunate, but I only know of Herman Gorst from the game and his backstory reading up on there, but I believe the only time that he's properly mentioned outside of that is actually, and you're going to hate me for this, when his depiction through the end time books. Oh. Fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that's the only book where he's outright mentioned, essentially acting as a uh, almost like a minor character to help stop the Von Karsteins uh... from being escaped. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I got, I got one for you guys. If you feel like moving on, can we uh, just spend a few minutes shitting on Harry Potter? Oh, let me <laughs> you tell know. you about Voldemort. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck it. Like, ugh. Voldemort, what is theoretically and conceptually one of the strongest liches in existence due to having seven phylacteries and never raises an undead in any of the films or the books? The only time he has ever raised an undead is in one of the video games. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, technically, he's got undead if you look at the, you know, like the films in that one bit with the, with um, Harry and, and Dumblecunt are in that fucking uh, Dumbledore. <laughs> no, a friend of mine's got a character no, called no, Dumblecunt. Keep Dumblecunt. Yeah. Keep Dumblecunt. <laughs> no, so, so um, Harry and Dumblecunt are basically in this what this underground on lake river thing, and Dumbledore Cunt has to <laughs> has to <laughs> has to drink this magical um, Gatorade. That's also killing him. Uh, ah, yes. And they've got all of those things that come out. Look, like, aren't they undead? They are technically undead, but the problem is he never then uses them in any of the fights that he uses. Which oh, you right. mean? I mean, if you took all of the undead that was shown in that scene and then threw them at the castle at the end of the final film, I think they would have had more. Or perhaps better and far more interestingly. If he cast a spell to, I don't know, reanimate the dead people that he kills in the castle, that would have been pretty effective. But no, he never does. And he's never even... Oh, it's very irritating because he's got an interesting concept for being a lich, but he never does anything with it. If there was any lich in any other media who had seven phylacteries, how could they possibly lose? Imagine, imagine if, uh, let's say... Not in Marco from the Elder Scrolls. If he had seven phylacteries, how the hell would he ever be able to be defeated? He never would be. But see, no. The way, see, the way I would go about it is like you'd have it where you'd have a Dark Lord with all of these phylacteries, and the books or the stories would be would purely be different characters in different parts of the world uncovering and destroying them one by one. 
And then when it comes to the to the actual Dark Lord or character being killed, it's from a completely different thing because you'd have like different people contri- contributing towards a common goal, but you'd have somebody else to actually finish that goal, and then that person would be lord in history, and everybody would forget about everyone else who, yeah, bit actually salty. That that would actually that yeah, fuck that. Um, <laughs> For a fantasy series, I think because it's more aimed at the children, young adult yeah. type of deal, they never properly go into necromancy, despite him very adamantly being a lich, and there's no other way you can get around it. He even has the decayed corpse-like look on him. But this is yeah, this is, this is, yeah. I was, about, I was about to say it's like children's book. By the way, he killed his parents while he was sitting in his crib. Oh wait, no wait. Oh wait, I thought you said he killed. Oh, I thought I was gonna say how, he killed his own parents. How the fuck did he survive that? <laughs> oh no, no, it's just like he he killed Harry's parents, but like, uh, uh, like I don't, I don't know if you can call it children's. Also, don't forget that giant fucking spider cave that still haunts me. That sounds like a Voldemort move: kill his own parents and ends up dying from neglect because he doesn't have anyone to help him. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. I was thinking to myself, like, wait, what? How did, how did he manage to survive that? Like, what? Did he just turn on the? Did he, did he crawl out of his crib, go downstairs, turn on the stove, put some sun something in the oven, job done? Although saying that, the the first time we ever see him as a child is he is in an orphanage. Hmm. Um, what twist? <laughs> Um, what was, what was it I was going to say? Yeah, it's what kind of gets me is that, like, if you'd have a character with all of those fighters, it would take years upon it, would take so much time to kill that character. And because of how old and how powerful they'd be, it would take even more time because of how old and powerful they'd be. Oh, 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 okay, okay. So it is a Voldemort move. Okay, it says, like, uh, his mom was, uh, 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 she died during childbirth. But after oh. that, he murdered his father and grandparents. Oh, so he did. Okay. Yep. Well, <laughs> well, there you go, then. How old was he when he? So okay, so he killed his mom when he was a kid. So how how, how old was he when he did everyone else? I have no clue. It doesn't say when did T- Tom kill his parents. Uh, Hold on, I'm gonna... saying, his soul. Average oh, what, 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 what? age of Fortnite players. <laughs> oh God. Uh. I've got a question for you, Cheb. What would you say is your favorite depiction of either undead or a necromancer in any media? Ooh, that's hard, man. Uh, my favorite necromancer is probably Krill. Y- you know Krill from uh, Age of Fear? Oh, yes. Krill He's just from such a stereotypical, like, evil, wanting to kill everything kind of necromancer. I kind of love that. Um... Yeah, I think Krill's cool. Beyond that, like, I have so many. Like, if you look at the bottom of this document here, I've got written down as favorites. I've got Nagash, Arthas, Orcus, Gravelord Nito, Vlad von Karstein, Cetra, Krill, Marlock, and Saztam. I don't know. I'm so disappointed that you cannot do any kind of necromancy in Dark Souls, even though they've got an actual embodiment of death. Right. No, right. Can can we just can we just have can we just spotlight the Tomb Kings for a moment? Because they're undead. Yeah. The focus isn't that they are undead. It's that yeah, they're undead. But they they it's how do I word it? It's like Egyptian curses, like heavily manifested. Kind like it, it's the way the way in which they are is that they're undead and they're. They know they're in dead, or some of them are in a little bit of denial about it. But being oh. un- being them being undead isn't all that they're about. Because when it comes to like uh, other types of undead and necromancy shit, that is pretty much all that they are. In the sense, as in, it's such a big pink thing about them that if you take that away, what's left? But with the Tomb Kings, if you was to take away the them being undead, they would still have so much of every, like they'll still have so much personality and so much history. And it, it would still work. I think it's more along the lines that they were a, a group or a, an entire continent, I guess, that existed before they became undead. And then through no fault of their own, they all became undead. And so now they're just continuing on being the people that they were before they became skeletons. Like the constructs, for example. Constructs involve 
a kind of ne- a really complicated, and I'm not really sure if I'd call it necromancy, where they take souls of old warriors and put them into stone and bone constructs and then have them fight. I guess you, that would be considered white necromancy, I suppose. No, no, no that's a soul mech. A soul mech. <laughs> Fair enough. 1526. And that kind of makes them. They have an identity of rather than just being undead hordes, they are the Tomb Kings who are a group of people who are proud, who are yeah, great like, warriors, and who don't need to be undead in order to exist. It's just mm. the fact that they are cursed to be undead. It's just, it's just something added on. It's just something added on top, and it adds into the aesthetic and everything else. And something that it's it's like with with um, necromancers up north in the old world in Warhammer, it's, it's like you've got Helm and Gorsh, you've got um, what's his name uh, Heinrich Kemp- Kemmler. Yeah, not Ham- not Ham- Heinrich Kemmler. Uh, Kemmler. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah you've, you've got a Ke- like you've got Kemmler. You've got and if you take away the necromancy, there's not they aren't really characters without that, are they? Cause exactly. But with the Tomb Kings, it, oh, they, I, I do like them a lot. I do like them so fucking much, and I, I just. About- Sorry, what about the pirates? I love them as well. They're probably my yes, favorite. yes. I don't know the lore about why or how they ended up how they are, but they they are very very well done. Yeah, I think I think that, the fucking DM about a raid the. I think that cursed pirates are quite. Um, they're more of a generic sort of cliche, but the thing is, is that they're not in a sense that you can take them and do whatever you wanted with them. Like Pirates of the Caribbean, for example, the first film has undead pirates. The second film introduces what the uh, octopus uh, fish people pirate, Davy Jones. Yeah, is, yeah. Davy Jones never outwardly addressed is actually a necromancer. It's <laughs> basically he's the vampire coast, but as a tentacle monster instead. Oh, so what would he be? Uh, Cthulhu pirate, Cthulhu pirate, Hulu. Pirate Hulu, pirate Hulu. The fire, yeah. <laughs> but like, but like the Vampire Coast, he in, sort of integrates nautical creatures into his reanimations, like mm. making people essentially live through attaching barnacles to their face and such which is yeah quite i i quite like that as a theming i don't know if i would consider it one of my favorite themings but it's definitely more interesting than generic skeletons and zombies being raised yeah i agree actually speaking of which i've actually got a really interesting example of interesting not uh necromancers but undead in general um from the game warframe um, oh yes, yeah. So, so there is. This. What do you mean? So what, you, the, what are you trying to say? So are you, there, are you on about Necros or what are you on about? Well, I was about to address. So Necros is uh, um, Cheb. Are you familiar at all with Warframe? Not at all. No. So okay, don't uh, spoil the law. Don't spoil no, it because people I, are going to be watching this and they're going to be playing it and they're not going to know the law and they know the law. Yes, they, they will see some weird shit in game that might just spoil the lore in general because you know they don't swap out between the veterans and the new players, so they'll yes. just. I, 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 will, I will not spoil yeah, yeah. the big thing that we all know, but no one else knows if they've ever played it. But mm. um, Unless they play like an hour, it'll just be spoiled because it's like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, yeah I've, done, I've done that a few times, Mike, so I'm not, not, not going to lie. I've just, I've just, yeah, I've done the thing and then I've just uh, realized, oh shit, it's a low mastery, but fuck. <laughs> anyway, so um, essentially... Through, it's a, a sci fi world in which you play as a uh, Warframes, which are basically robot ninjas. Um, one of them. Space ninjas. Space robot ninjas. Space robot with ninja jiggle pirates. Physics. <laughs> with jiggle physics. Um, with jiggle physics and a shit ton of <clears throat> art. <laughs> art, yes. Um, <laughs> and there is. You, you can play as a whole but a bit different bunch of characters. One of them is a necromancer character, though he's not a very good depiction of like gameplay mm. wise his name's necros and he's essentially uh this is going to sound strange he's the farming warframe he farms things for items instead of actually now the thing is with that that actually does make sense because you've got the grim reaper harvest he's reaping the harvest yeah yeah i suppose um yeah anyway he's not what i'm here to talk about because his depictions are sort of eh is gameplay wise not a very good necromancer? Oh, are you on about uh, what's his fucking name? Revenant. 
Oh no no not even revenant. Re- well, revenant's Aww. interesting. Revenant's a uh, revenant's essentially a um, ghost yes. armor um, who's given up. No no no. I'm not talking about a warframe. I'm talking about something bigger. Something. Oh, the infested. No no no. Something far more dangerous. Uh, I'm here mean? to talk about the necromex. Oh. oh. So essentially. Uh, there are there is a an organization who existed in the world of Warframe called the Orokin, who were basically the big bad guys who were all we're made of gold and everyone has to listen to us. And they went to war with a race called the Sentients, who are a group of basically, robots. Basically, basically precursor race doing pre- precursor race things. Exactly. Um, and yes, I was about to say I'll, I'll post another one as well. Um, so basically oh you beat me to it yeah. <laughs> so um there's essentially different families within the uh Orican empire that existed and they were looking for ways to defeat the sentience because the sentience have this annoying habit that they can essentially adapt their physical biology and make up to essentially adapt to whatever uh combat Imagine- scenario they ended up in Imagine nobles, except the nobles that have incredible education and resources and ability, and less inbred. Mm-hmm. Also, they have the ability to essentially go ascend to lich them because they can body swap by putting their souls out of their bodies and putting them in other people. Mm. Um, but one of the families that existed during the times where they were fighting against the sentients were called the Entrati. And the Entrati, they came up with a concept for a fighting machine uh, to fight against the sentients. And that's where these lovely giant golden robots came in called Necromex. So they started off as just drones made up of. I thought, uh, if anything, they start off with the body being a big golden cucumber. <laughs> I'd call them a corn on a cob more, but that one <laughs> too. It's really good for it. <laughs> um, but what they were is forgetting their little casket things they, they were just giant robots that fought against them but the problem was uh, they started just uh, fighting against the sentience and the sentience adapted to whatever was being thrown at them so they never ended up being that effective so instead they thought of the idea well why don't we put in a human pilot because a human pilot can adapt his fighting strategies in order to better fight against the sentience so they did they put in human pilots but the problem was with these necromex in human pilots if the pilot died then they lost the entire robot and with how brittle humans are we died quite often so they had to come up with another solution so they came up with the concept now which you see in front of you of the actual necromex which are essentially uh entombed corpses skeletons that are being remotely controlled through something spoilery that allows you to directly control these giant undead mechs. So you are essentially controlling through a necromantic process, a skeleton that is piloting what is essentially a Gundam. Mm. And the thing as well is that, uh, weren't these the precursor to... Uh, no, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> they were essentially uh, 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 <laughs> the older uh, model to the Warframe. Jeff, can you just edit out what I've just said there? So instead, it just has this sort of uh, getting ready about something else. Uh, I'll see what I can do. Cheers. Uh, but question. yes, so they were a. Um, this is essentially what I like to talk about is a good depiction of necromancy and sci fi because, as you've mentioned various points before, the problem with necromancy in a sci-fi setting is obviously robots are superior. So mm. instead, why don't you just take the best part of necromancy, i.e. the ability to raise something that's died back to life, and then attach it into a robot suit? So it's got the advantages of a robot being invincible, being made of steel, and being able to not eat, sleep, or etc. Right and and you're able to consistently revive it from the dead. That's pretty cool, I gotta say. Yeah, it's an interesting concept, and in game, it's also really cool. But wasn't wasn't there a thing uh, with the community where people were kind of like comparing it to war uh, to Warhammer Forty K a bit? That's, like, yeah, yeah. Well, didn't they get one of the people from Warhammer Forty K to work on? This, or was it inspirational? I think they did. They had at least an artist from Forty K to work on it. Yeah. I'm trying to think. What was I gonna fucking say? Uh, personally, I enjoy the combat from both Necros and Revenant. I can just kind of like switch between the two. 
because being able to dominate enemies and raise enemies is usually fun. I prefer... I like, I, yeah. I also, it's like, if you have the proper cards for Necros, then they can be really fucking interesting. Just yeah. become unkillable. It's just a shame that he's not got very good minion gameplay, unfortunately. Mm. Um, what yeah, about... Only, all the way, it, it, it's kind of hard for, the, for them to do good minion gameplay, because, like, last tangent is, like, the only like good guy who actually has like a good fucking minion is Wu Kong because he's like so built into his kit. But past that, they have a struggle. They are struggling to put in minions in general for any Warframe. Yeah. Right? That fucking bitch was like, what was Nova? Mind controls an enemy. It has like no more fucking. A- no, 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 no. It's AI Nix. Nix. Don't compare Nova and Nix. Nova's the one that's <laughs> Nova's the one that teleports and speeds up the game. Nix is the one that's fucking useless. <laughs> I guess oh, it's just okay, Mike, right is, right. Mike is the one that's trash, except for pressing your four and building her to just fucking nuke everything. But nobody ever does that because she's trash. I think it's just mostly yeah. a game about space ninjas rather than space necromancers, unfortunately, and that's yeah. what they wanted to go with. What about um, Oblivion and, in fact, the Elder Scrolls in general? What about I was going to mention Dragon's necromancy? Dogma. I was going to mention Dragon's Dogma. Um, Elder Scrolls. The thing is about Elder Scrolls, necromancy is quite um, common, I guess. In the but they do, like really. they do put into a thought process, but there's not too much beyond that. Like they'll kind yeah. of like think about like, okay, how do we make the undead stronger? Uh, or like just basically just like based how, on how do make an undead stronger? Like, Simple, big go, big go, bone Goliath. How do you make it even stronger? Put fucking blue fire on it. <laughs> yeah, oh, Elder it's, Scrolls it's, Online. Yeah, pretty much like that's the whole fucking thought process. And then beyond that, they don't do too much. Like, there are the ideal masters, like we've just said a couple of times before, but like, we don't really know anything behind that, nor is that even remotely possible. So there's no real thing for us. It's surprising, because considering how Elder Scrolls is Elder Scrolls, you'd imagine that when it comes to lore, they would have something quite developed for necromancy. Yeah, it's very kind of... I guess it's one of those ways, because... Mm, it, it's very like mostly shrouded mystery slash to player can't yeah. use that shit. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 I'd say mostly it's a character thing rather than an actual undead thing. So the characters of the Elder Scrolls universe, when it comes to ones that are involved in necromancy and undead, are far more interesting than the actual undead themselves. Yeah, ideal masters and men of Marco, the Lord of Worms, or is it the God of Worms now? Yeah, I think it's the I God. Mean, Lord I can't help but think that because of like with um, necromancy's connection to Moonlight like Bell that you'd have it where in Mer like Bell would sort of have it where his followers like necromancers are sort of dominating death or life or something like that. Like they've got some kind of dominance over something uh, to, to raise the dead and control them. Because it's, I mean, I mean, eh, it could well. Work. Technically, more like Ball only has complete control over vampires. Necromancy has existed within the universe as a sort of just omniscient force that exists. Oh, he, okay. he, he uses necromancy a lot, obviously, and vampires are inherently ingrained with them. But why don't? The, yeah. But the only reason why he has control over most vampires is because he's technically all of their fathers. So that's kind of why that exists. But. In well, terms of actual necromancy, I think it's just that he's proficient in it. Do you think it would yeah. be the case where the reason as to why there's so little about it is because Lorcan would possi- would could possibly be the god of necromancy, and because he's fucking dead. Who? Uh, Lorcan, like, um, is the one who tricks the the vines into creating Tamriel, uh, the Mundus. Oh, and then, oh, and I don't in, know. yeah, he did it for a big joke uh, for his fucking uh, TikTok video, and then the uh, the vines got really pissy, so then they ripped out his fucking heart. What no, do you guys? think, Jeb? I think it's um, uh, like, uh, that it's mysterious because, like, sometimes it's better that way to let the players or whatever kind of like puzzle it. Oh yeah, like together. So maybe keep it putting, puzzle, putting the puzzle together, like that kind of mystery is fun, but like there's not too much for like the for the common player to do. It's core, uh, considering towards necromancy, you have either summon a uh, uh, minions from the soul cairn or just revive the dead bodies for a spot for like a few minutes, and that's pretty much it. It becomes we can't more of a like, gameplay mechanic rather yeah, than an action or anything else. We can't really do anything beyond that. We can't do any of that fun shit. Like, uh, even if you like, read some, like, the, uh, uh, like, the base, uh, Nag Master stuff, it's, 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 it's like, it pushes, like, a lot of fucking preparation. Like, strapping some leather stuff to the bones, then, like, embalming if you want them to stay around for longer. It's not too great beyond that that's pretty much what the fucking daily life looks like the necromancer looks like just pull someone from the swamps uh, it's, it's, you know their bones from the swamps so you, since the fucking mud crabs somehow eat everything 
See, Elder Scrolls could learn, uh, like Elder Scrolls Online, when it comes to the Necromancer class, could learn a fair bit from WoW in that department because when it comes to WoW, the classes like um, in BFA, the classes were just really fucking dumbed down and stripped. But cons- like throughout the into all of the expansions, there has been multiple moments where the classes play an important role in the player being able to interact with the world. Like, for example, warlocks have a quest wherein they'll be able to change the color of their fire. It's purely cosmetic, but they actually get to talk to their demons in order to figure out where this tome has come from. Um, like druid, like druids, um, balanced druids will be able to sort of like uh, purify wargun um, in legion to get some artifact power and whatnot. Um, if you've got like the if you're a death knight and you're frost and you've got the fucking uh, like artifact for this or that then you then you get to see visions of arthur so like stuff like that as in as in there's more to, there's there's a lot more but i mean those are the ones that just come to mind but it's it's the case where you have little things that allow the classes to interact more but eso doesn't really have any of that because the classes aren't so big compared to wow's one so that, and you can have characters that could like would have a class but they don't use any class abilities and it would work really well still because that's how ESO is. Mm -hmm. Guys, do you feel like pooping on something? You know what, mate? You know what, mate? Uh, Being a British lad, I'm always always prepared to sh** something. All right, let's take a big old steaming dump on Twilight. Oh, joy. (laughs) And that's where (laughs) Twilight is. (laughs) Four vampires. I'm more of a Oh, the vampire guy. shit. Oh, Mr. Glitter himself. All Mr. Right. Glitter. <laughs> not even that. Not even that. He's a fucking pedo as well. Because think about it. He's a, he's a, he's a vampire. He- how many years old is he? Thousands of years? Hundreds of years? I don't know. Like, yeah, that's, that's one of my problems with that guy shit as well. So like, and, then, uh, and then he spends most of his time in a fucking American secondary school, high school, uh, looking at women. What? As you yeah. do. Like if if fucking what if if I want to say Rupert Murdoch because he's old as fuck, but if if you had like um, somebody in the royal family like uh, the queen, like if the queen was to go to a college and start perusing the male selection, that's what? just another day in the royalty duties. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like one segment, it's just like side tangent. Is like to be fair, once you're that old, I don't think you can do anything because like. Even if you're fucking ancient, like just find like a hundred twelve year old, there's still that's to be like too young for you. So it's like at that point you just gotta say fuck it, because there's no middle ground or high ground. It's only low. Well, no, that's the thing though, because like he he does look really really young. But if anything, given how old he is and how mature you would think he would be, why is oh he maturity with... gone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he, why he, why he isn't dumb. like why why isn't he with older women? Like you, you'd imagine that he would. Sure, well, no. actually beautiful like not ones that look hot and they're good in their 20s but ones that look more mature and good in their 30s or 40s or even 50s i have an answer for this do you want to know what the answer is yes please. go on teenage angst <laughs> oh yeah shit compl- i was completely forgot about that and then it's also te- it's also um the target audience is fucking teenage girls yeah okay. also teenage angst combined with veganism because the vampires are vegan for <sighs> oh, what reasons what yeah, he, 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 well, like, sadly enough, I've actually seen one of these films, and it's awful, but regardless, <laughs> the, the stuff that I have seen from it is essentially the reason why they're existing in modern times is because they've kept themselves very hidden because they've become pacifists. They don't want to uh, go and start drinking the blood from people anymore, so they started drinking the blood from animals. And that's not very fucking vegan, then, not, is it? Yeah, I was about to say, that's not yeah. fucking vegan. Well, like, <laughs> vampire <laughs> veganism. <laughs> there's, a, there's a fucking Minecraft mod called Witchery, and fucking, it even mentions in, like, the fucking, uh, on the website, I think, where, oh yeah, vampires can go vegetarian if they want, veget- like, or, or can go... They, they don't go, they don't have to play a blood or village a blood, they just go, they just drink from fucking animals. Yeah, I think it's kind of the type of thing where they're like, oh, we're just so misunderstood, and oh, we're just so sensitive, we don't want to hurt anyone, we just care about, you know, not becoming the animals that we are, but then they just drink from animals anyway. And it thing, doesn't make sense. The thing that annoys me a lot when it comes to fucking Twilight is like, the undead is one thing, but there is so much opportunity with the Native American werewolves. Oh yes. Like, like they could have gone full fucking uh, Skinwalker. 
they could have like turned them into like not just into fucking furries. They could have gone so far beyond that. They could have like had it where you've got ones. Oh, yeah. it's like oh yeah, you know, in the woods, you know, when you're out in the woods and you hear cr- creepy noises. Yeah, do you want to know what makes those noises? Well, basically, some of us go fucking batshit insane and can't control ourselves, and these ones become fucking mutated. So and they start eat, becoming what they eat. So then you'll have things with like a fucking wolf skull with fucking antlers and great big fucking flayed decaying flesh. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that's just Barry. He fucking lost. He just fucking lost <laughs> his fucking marbles. That's a lot of fuckings in one sentence. <laughs> if you ever want to have a fun afternoon of just laughing at something terrible, look up on YouTube the scenes in which the wolves talk to each other in human voices, but they're still in wolf form, so they just have, like, their move, their lips moving, but they're speaking human words. It's so bizarrely badly done. Jeez. Uh, that sounds awful. I mean, I mean, to be fair, uh, furries weren't a big thing back then, so we've not had the developments in technology to make that more accurate. <laughs> Uh, also, also, like, I think you just want to go for the fucking standard stereotype of were- a werewolf fucking vampire, even though no clue why. No, it's, isn't it more like a cats and dogs thing? But the thing is, it's bats and dogs. Hang on. Pat- yeah, um, and I, don't know, I don't know. It's just a random fucking thing. How did that whole thing start with vampires against werewolves? I, actually, let me look that up. What, when, what is early- I'm actually not sure, early- because... Because I think werewolves are... I know that werewolves are more European, but I think they're more Western... Like, I think they're more sort of um, German... I want to say German-European. But vampires are more Romanian, aren't they? Like, I know that vampires yeah. are quite a thing all over the world. Like, you'll have... Uh, I mean, Crash, you had a, a fucking vampire scares in England and Scotland, but... Like, yeah, when it's, it's, it's even weirder when you consider the fact that... It, the t- the traditional depictions of vampires had them able to transform into wolves themselves. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Uh, okay. Wolves, okay. Uh, bats, uh, uh, clouds. All right, all right. Yeah. I, I just I, I just looked it up. Uh, we can just blame the media on this. Uh, there's two answers technically. Uh, uh the history of vampires versus werewolves stems for movies, universal Universal Pictures specifically. Uh, first vampire fight werewolf things started with Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Oh, of course. Of and there's also a compl- uh, another one is like the first movie source of conflict between the werewolf and vampire is Dracula versus the Wolfman. <laughs> so it, it's it, there's no like mytho- mythological reason or anything like that. It's just because of fucking media. Just, I was it's, just imagining an immortal deity capable of grand acts of necromancy, <laughs> completely indestructible to normal means, takes on a dude who likes to get to go into the woods and shit in a fool. <laughs> Like, yeah. I'm, just, I'm a bit it's disappointed. It, I was expecting so much. I was expecting like some kind of fucking mythological deity no? of, of like representing two opposite sides of the coin. Like you'd have like uh, w- wolves, like werewolves that would represent like the fucking bestial side of humanity versus vampires. Hu- like humanity's arrogance and need to fucking not die, just going head to toe to toe. Like you've, you, you could have civilized man without a soul versus fucking bestial man with a soul covered in fur. And shit. No, no, it, it, it's just, it's just media. It's just media Hollywood, said. man. <laughs> fucking hell. Yep. I'm, just, I'm just picturing like an 80s fucking cheap costume Dracula just beating the shit out of a <laughs> fucking first <laughs> 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 Probably. Oh, fucking hell. Okay, then. Alright, guys, we got like, uh, seven minutes left. Should we praise something or shit on something? Oh, should we leave, like should we leave it on a positive note or a negative note or a comical note? What 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 do you guys want to do? Um, we could. I I feel like shitting on stuff to be honest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, what do you want to shit on, mate? The old beaten British way of just shitting on fuck whatever, do I? <laughs> what, on, what what do you think of Sylvanas Windrunner? Like Dragon Age Inquisition. Oh yeah, true. We could bring. Uh, <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Let me begin. The, 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 the initiation process was interesting. It's just like, you, you know, tell like, us. Res- you, you can't like, say that the it's... Spirit. Sorry, Sorry no, go no, no, you go, you go. Uh, you can't say we've got seven minutes and then give us two things with half an hour's worth of content to talk about. <laughs> right. Yes. True. But, like, go on, but, like, like, Dragon Age Inquisition. It's interesting, like, initiation process. Like, it's not so much as, like, manipulating the spirits entirely, but, like, kind of, like, getting, like, garnering their respect, going to certain shrines, just kind of, like, doing this like, whole, like, semi-pilgrimage fucking thing. And then you just have like nothing beyond that. It's like you can you get some will o wisps or uh, one soul for like 20, 30, 30 seconds? 30 seconds. Uh, have fun, chuckle fuck. 
It is the worst implementation I've ever played. It's utter shit. Now that's a video idea for you to show how terrible it is. <laughs> I can't even bring it's this up to play It's just a fucking video format of just how to not do necromancy in gaming. Seriously, guys, stop fucking doing this. Number one, Guild Wars 2. <laughs> okay, no, uh, go on. I was going to say, because like, I was going to say that like, my fucking have, has better necromancy than fucking Dragon Age Inquisition, but I'm interested in your fucking Guild Wars 2 now. Go on, go on, continue. Oh, you, you, uh, I don't really know too much about Guild Wars 2, to be honest, but like, uh, I basically like my own gameplay of it. Um, Guild Wars 2 is an MMORPG, some, but somehow they, they downgraded necromancy. I heard there's like a lot more fun shit and like uh, stuff you can do in Guild Wars 1, but in Guild Wars 2, it basically just dumbed it down to green damage wizard, which means like where I got the, where I coined the whole fucking just saying of don't make a green damage wizard. You guys basically just Guild Wars 2. You have your standard stuff of like getting a pet and then I don't fucking know. Like you can have some iterations of basically I think it's three pets at a time, like one pet in front, one pet in the side next to you and like one uh, semi like duration summon. Mm. And after that, there's also like l certain levels of fucking like uh things you can ach uh, achieve like there's a lich form you can get or a reaper form yeah, yeah and at, at, yeah. At, mo at most it's just like raise eight of these little fucking things on crawling legs i don't know why they call it necromancy because those are lich those are just those are just bugs or some shit i'm not sure what they are they look like fucking zerglings it's and uh, you raise right them. with human skulls i think a lot of them are more no, 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 no i don't think they're human skulls i think they're, they're just straight up zerglings you raise from the ground i don't know how oh, you find them ones. yeah yeah yeah, yeah I don't know. And, and, it's, and it's like the most numerous undead you can even get it's like you can get like six of them at a time if you do some weird random bullshit even though it's like it's so not worth it at that point you you don't even be able to just use your minions in general it's just you're the strong person the minions are just like a little fucking side note which is not how you do it here we go bone fiend i think it's because the necromancer uh necromancer Oh, I'm hoping anyway, because having these things naturally appear would actually be quite horrifying, but also would work quite well. But the, the thing, yeah, but that, that just make him a fucking beast tamer. Then that's wow, not that looks like a tyranid. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's, it's like a tyranid zergling. That's not a fucking thing a necromancer could have. Ooh, necromancer tyranids. Now there's an idea. Oh. <laughs> Don't uh, isn't that already a thing in in the space too with the cravers? Oh, actually, wait, no, 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 uh, Endless Legend with fucking, um, it, undead buggy boys. Damn, even the goddamn concept art of Guild Wars looks so much better than fucking Guild Wars 2. What is that? that? That's a great depiction of you versus the guy she tells you not to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what was I going to say? Um, oh yeah, so you've also got, like, these ones with, uh, these fucking rats with the fucking human skulls. Two fucking skulls rats! Or rat, my. Fuck you, rat! Yeah. I kind of love that. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it works uh, so good. I kind of love it. Uh, Shitting on both the Skaven and humanity? Nice. <laughs> no. you know, like, oh, oh, here's the thing that heals you as well. Um, if it, oh, I should know. That's a shit image. Yeah, go on. Uh, I kind of feel bad for them because they've they've been trying to do something different, and I, I respect that. But I'm not mm. sure it turned out well. It's the oh, thing is that thing. the issue I kind of have with Guild Wars. I've tried Guild Wars so many times. Like I bought it when it first came out, and I've gone on it on and off since then. Like I've got a max level character. It's just it can't keep me interested. For an extended period, I can only play it for so long. Like with WoW, I would fucking play that on and on. With Elder Scrolls Online, I'd play it on and on and on. I fucking, sp I've probably spent more time on fucking RuneScape than I have on fucking Guild Wars Two, yeah. and that says a lot. But it's yeah. they have a lot of really good stuff. The abstract um, art is really, really fantastic. Like uh, they've got interesting races. They've got and they're very interesting way they want to go about it. It's just it kind of. The problem I have with it is that it doesn't really feel challenging a lot. As in, the level, like the leveling is fine. It's just <laughs> you log in, you've got a reward. Okay. Oh, you just have found this point of interest. You get a fucking reward. Okay. You've leveled up. Pick your reward. Okay. You've killed this mob. You killed five hundred of this mob. Get a fucking reward. You know what? You've walked five kilometers. Get a fucking reward. <laughs> Fuck off. Uh, Give me a challenge. Give me a boss. Yeah. That's gonna kick my shit in. Yeah, I, I think I actually spent more time in Guild Wars 2 just running around trying to collect the rewards and actually killing shit. Yeah. I can't get over that Skeleskaven. 
I wanted to carry my books around. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, do we have enough time to shit on Sylvanas and praise the glorious undead in Dragon's Dogma? Not you know the series, what? the game. We're at an hour and thirty minutes, but let's push it a bit. Let's go to one forty-five. This, we can we can push it. We have the technology. Yeah. <laughs> if you guys are okay with it, like we can do that. I'm fine. I'm cool. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, do you guys want to talk about Sylvanas first? Yeah, I can sort of begin if you want. So I don't have too yeah, much sure. to say about it, but I don't know. I just don't like her somehow. Like she started out as this like annoying elf that you kill as Arthas, and he punishes her by making her into a ghost. And then, like, you think that's the end of it. But then, wait a minute, she's she's back. What's she doing back? Now she's this, like, annoying character, right? Like, I don't know too much about it, but I, I know that she annoyed me when I played World of Warcraft. I'm trying to find art of her alive, and I'm finding not that art, uh, let me say. I, I just don't like her somehow. I can't quite put my finger on why. It's The thing is with her story is... It, I feel like it was good originally, because on Warcraft, on Warcraft Three, uh, not Reforged, uh, not that one. Um, she, yeah, she's she's a ranger general who's protecting her home from you, the undead, big bad. You can understand that and respect that. She goes out of her way to do what she can. She's stalling. She's you know struggling. She's fucking cursed. Like every time you get closer and uh, win, she's cursing and you know getting a lot more desperate and a lot more upset. Like you can see that you can see that she's legitimately doing this for her people, and you can absolutely respect that. The thing is, and then and then of course Arthur decides, yeah, no, she's an annoying cunt. Let's let's just do her in. So then you get the side objective, which is you know, law that uh, Arthur kills her and then brings her back as a as a banshee and whatnot. And she's there screaming and she's all upset and she basically watches her people get shit on and yeah. And then, and then she, and then she somehow gets control. Because, oh no, no, she gets control because the Lich King's weakening his uh, weakens, and she goes back to her body. And so, like that, you can kind of get. She has a clear objective. Her clear motive is to get revenge. That's what's driving her. She's no longer alive. Her people have been fucked over. Her people don't even fucking like her anymore because she's an undead. So she can't even relate with them. She's all alone. One sister is fucked off with uh, Teralian, who later comes back as a one-dimensional character. Um, Valera is fucked off to go fuck a human, which Sylvanas can relate with. Yeah. Um, and what is it? What, what is it with Sylvanas and her sisters fucking like liking man meat? Uh, plot reasons. Okay. The pr- 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 fantasy. Male fantasy. Fucking hell. Uh, so you've got so you've got that. Um, I think I'm just going to put a green text. I'm just, I'm just going to put a little green. There we go. Here's here's a green text. I'm just going to put Actually, that. In how here. how horny is it? Like if it's like incredibly horny, that's just male fantasy. Like it's, a fucking it's, like it's, that it's one. The, it's an account. It's an account of elf uh, physiology. That is really interesting and it's definitely accurate in all forms of media. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it's that's all for good and well. The problem I have is after she kills the Lich King, it's clear that Blizzard has no fucking oh. to do with oh, her. Dude, I remember I remember why I hate her. It was that stupid way she kills that Lich King guy. Or huh? uh, in the cinematic. Lich- <gasps> Bolfar! The, the 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 fire one, the flaming yeah. one. I saw yeah, that. I no, like, Man, she doesn't kill him, she just kicks his shit in and doms him. Yeah, I was like, man, this is trash. Like she even she even gets like chains to his nipples and everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, like it's it's she does really fucked up shit as well. Before then, and then and that's all good because it's all it's it's one of those where it's similar to Illidan's uh, Stormrage in the sense where the ends justify the means. The thing is though is that she's not an edge lord who gets cucked by by uh, his much cooler and you know awesome uh, droid brother. Um. She's fucking Sylvanas. She's leading a, f- a free undead. Their future is their own. There's so many story opportunities with this. So many ways that Blizzard could take it. You can have those that want to reconnect with their family, which they do kind of do this in, uh, in the end slightly. But they could have done it so much more. It's like they could. You could have had different factions of undead. You could have ones that don't like Sylvanas and instead want to reunite with their loved ones. You could have ones that see themselves as monstrosities and are fully given to nihilistic tendencies. You could have ones that fucking see death uh, as some kind of religious or holy thing and justify death and explain death through the making a god or some kind of religion behind that. Like they could do so much with it, but they just fucking don't. And then 
like Blizzard are trying to, you know, focus on adding more microtransactions to make their giant Doom Fortress made of money. Yeah. Uh, it's it's really really sad as well because it's like you, you look you look at Warcraft and they had so many different factions. It wasn't just Horde Alliance. You had like fucking Stromgarde. You had like fucking uh, Lordaeron. You had all of these different ones. You had all of these all of these different orc tribes. And you had like all of these different tribes. There's there's a lot of emphasis put put on all of these different ones. And they just fucking dumbed it down and uh, they've just made it into fast food. And it's it's one of those where it tastes nice, but you have it for too too long and it's and you can definitely you it's unhealthy and you want better shit. And you, you go into better things. It's it's like discount Warhammer. I'd say we should probably move on to yeah. something maybe more positively depicted. Yeah. Just, uh, well, like, isn't there like technically like three forms of undead, more or less, in Warhammer? There's you know the Council of Sylvania, your kind of standard necromancers with your fucking C faction for some reason. You have the uh, the Tomb Kings, who I'm not entirely too sure if you can call them dead because. It's, it's it's a part of them, but yeah, they are, it's, they it's, are dead. It's just it's it's not focused on, which I think focused, which, yeah. it, it's really, it works really really well for them to flesh them out. And then there's also the fucking Necrons, which are a weird thing. They're uh, usually not too important, but so when, in, when, it, when it came to the, when, it, when it came to their world engine, in the words of text speech Emperor, I want one. Yeah. I'd say they're they're a bit like the Tomb Kings, where them being un- technically undead is kind of just a thing about them, but it's not their focus. And that they're more focused upon, you know, bringing about their. Gr- I, I, actually, it, quite a lot of similarities now that I think about it to do with the Tomb Kings. Their undead nature is just due to a mistake that they made, and mm-hmm. now they're just looking to basically reinstate their empire across the entire. And fi- yeah, and fix themselves. So yeah, I'd I'd say they're actually quite similar to the Tomb Kings, but mm. I say I think I, mean, I actually researched this before we came to this podcast. I think there's only one actual depiction of actual necromancy in 40k, which is uh, something to do with oh, what's in? the 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 plague chaos god, who I have forgotten the name Nurgle. of. Nurgle. What the Nurgle? Nurgle. Yeah, he apparently, one of his acolytes is capable of raising zombie corpses, but I cannot, and let me look this up. I was, gonna, I was gonna say, doesn't like Mortarion, uh, Primarch of the Emperor, doesn't, wasn't he put on a necromancer world? Like, as where his backstory was, like, he was on a necromancer world, and taken great and did some, like, as in he was raised as in grown up being looked after by this one particular necromancer. And then he explored, found some people that were suffering, realized his dad was evil. Then the emperor came and was like, you know what? I'm going to fucking do your shit for you, you little shit. And then the emperor just kind of kills, stole Mortarian's father. And yeah, emperor's a bit of a dick, really, isn't he, uh, doing that? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's the name of the guy. Yeah, What's yes. That? So Croesus is um, the hand of Nurgle, and uh, his whole thing is not exactly necromancy. It's just that he happens to have um, a plague which can turn corpses into bloated zombies. A zombie, mm-hmm. more of a zombie plague than it is necromancy. Okay. I think that's the only actual proper necromancy even 40k which makes sense i suppose because again it is sci-fi so yeah i was about to say i, I was gonna think like why nurgle at the same time most of the chaos gods can probably have their necromancy like fucking sunesh can definitely just say it's like either fetish thing of like living necrophilia or you know just like the perversion of life like I that suppose. kind of fucking stick the chaos gods and, are literally power, like power beyond comprehension. I'm pretty gonna, sure. That yeah, that I was gonna say, wouldn't Slanesh, wouldn't Slanesh have it like, oh, oh, we're, we're enslaved by their desire, so they, so they eat you just in the way you don't expect. Yeah, and you know, fucking Zinch, he could just say, oh, it's part of my grand plan. You don't fucking know, but I'm gonna use these guys. Uh, <laughs> Mm, I feel like Zinch wouldn't really go for it because, like, the thing is, is that the four of them um, they've got like opposites to it. Like, Corn and Sinesh, uh, Sinesh are kind of opposite, whereas Nurgle and Zinch are opposite. Like, Nurgle, Nurgle represents uh, stagnancy, um, inevitable decay, cycles of decay, stuff like that. Like, the thing, like, the thing is with Nurgle, he's basically nature in a way because 
he's really really tough and shit like that and it's got all of his diseases and whatnot but it's all it's it's not just focused on decay it's the case where you'll have de- like you'll look at earth for example you, you have extinction events that wipe everything out but then life continues on anyway you'll have things that will die and they will rot away but they also provide sustenance for everything else and it keeps life going and stuff like that like he's he's more sort of he's definitely more tanky and zombies and undead work for him but with zinch Zinch is more opposite. Like he's completely fucking change. Everything has to change all the fucking time. He's got plots within plots within plots within plots. Um, may I ask you a question once you're done? Mm, yeah. So um, it's just about like I know for a fact that uh, Nagash, when he's a god, and Nurgle have various wars, and like I was just wondering, like if does Nurgle actually control undead? Uh, no, he's more of a plagues and disease type yeah. of individual. Ah, uh, shit, I've just fucking realised. No, no, Zinch does have fucking... Because you've got the fucking... Fuck, okay, then, yeah, no, I'm talking bullshit. <laughs> uh, I, uh, when it comes to Age of Sigmar, I think it, Undead is basically just Nagash and Nagash's entire thing. Although, again, I, I, it's kind of like a good indication as to why I'm not the biggest fan of Nagash, despite him looking the coolest. It's like... In in uh, Age of Sigmar, everything is going wrong due to chaos, and Sigmar himself wants to bring everyone together to fight the common enemy of ne- of of the chaos gods, and he brought Nagash he brought Nagash into the universe back from uh, fantasy to help him do so, and Nagash betrays him, even though the chaos is very clearly the main enemy. He can't just put aside his anger and his selfishness for just a minute it's yeah a bit of a twat. I, I suppose that kind of is in character for him being the standard necromancer type but it's 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 irritating because he could he could have his dominion of undead and control the world but if he just waited and killed and focused on killing chaos first see it amuses me when it comes to fucking uh what have a fantasy 40k because in Warhammer Fantasy, Sigmar is basically fucking Conan the Barbarian, is our Lord and Savior. And then in in 40k, it's oh yeah, the, the God Emperor of Mankind, Science Jesus Christ, go, uh, who's Science Christian Jesus Christ, is our God and Savior. <laughs> theory, I believe that Sigmar is one of the lost Primarchs. I believe. I, f- uh, I thought that Warhammer. F- I thought the Warhammer Fantasy and 40k are separate, as in they're in... Like, they've got similar shit, but they're in separate universes. Separate universes, but they're in multiverses. Considering Age of Sigmar... Oh, right. Considering okay. Age of Sigmar involves literal, like, planes hopping between worlds, it kind of just mm. opened up as, oh, it's just another in the multiverse. And so people thought, hmm, there's lost Primarchs in 40k. Maybe Sigmar is one of the lost Primarchs. I guess it would make sense. I mean, considering, yeah, I was going to say, considering how you've got, like, shit in Age of Sigmar. <sighs> Fucking that. You've got way off topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what was that? Okay, so can I, uh, just just real quick for Sylvanas. The reason as to why she's so shit now is because her objective has been done. She's got no clear fucking future, and she's pretty much a character without a directive. She's got no objective. She's got no goal. Like they're just they're just fucking stringing her along with oh no this is all part of the master plan I don't even think the fucking writers know what her fucking master plan is because she fucking doesn't and she's OP as fuck like yes that's what annoys me the most about her how did she defeat that guy so easily in the cinematic uh it doesn't make it's because sense. she'd apparently made a deal with the jailer the jailer be bad and you the thing the problem with this though is that wow does this magic the gathering does this and so many others do this we're in it's basically it's spin the wheel we've got villain of the year so they'll spin the wheel and then you'll have the newest biggest baddest threat which is which is worse than all of the other previous ones so it's like oh what's this we've, we've got we've got a fucking cult that worship the sun who wants to destroy the world with sunlight oh they're the new biggest bad we need to stop them and save the world oh what's this now the burning legion is coming and the the demons and they're gonna fucking kill it. Oh, they're the biggest baddest threat. Oh, what's what's this? The fucking uh, on Magic the Gathering. The fucking Ni- uh, Nicholas fucking Bolin has come in with his great big fucking egg between his head and his fucking undead army, and he's I just wonder why they mm. just say screw it all. We'll go somewhere else where everyone's not trying to kill us. Yeah, it's. <sighs> Like, I can understand that it, they need to carry on the story, they need to make the content and whatnot. It's just, the, it's so fucking 
Everyone is fucking done. Just have a good fucking plot instead of just introduce the newest big, biggest baddest. We can, nobody can take them seriously because everybody knows they're going to be dead within the next year or so. And the jailer is just fucking one of those. And it's, fuck me. <laughs> is that fucking? Is that fucking forty? <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not fucking. I <sighs> Rename podcast title to the word "fuck." I'm not, <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing it on purpose. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just, a, I'm just an Anglo with oh, a, no. bare, a very big profanity filter. I know. Same, same. Oh, fuck me! Oh, for fuck's sake! <laughs> 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 just, <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Just, just. <laughs> All right, guys. What are we doing next? <sighs> okay, well, there's Undead in Magic the Gathering, and there's also Undead in Dragon's Dogma. I like Undead in Dragon's Dogma. You can't do a lot of necromancy magic in Dragon's Dogma, but the thing is, is that necromancy in Dragon's Dogma has a... L- it's, it's ambiguous, and it's quite unknown, and it's quite not fully developed yet, because of how it is, it works really, really well. Liches and whatnot are a thing in that. Undead dragons are a thing in that. Ghosts are a thing in that. The Undead come out during nighttime, because during the day, they get fucked. Fuck! Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go the rest of this podcast without swearing. With no profanity. This is what we're going to do. That's going to be hard for you. You're British. This is what we're going to do. It's going to be It's going to be great. Okay. Starting now. Okay. Somebody else talk about Dragon's Dogma if you know about it. You're going to uh, fail, man. You're going to say there's, there's, any there's, there's dragons and they're dogmaing. There you go. You know what? I don't know shit about Dragon's Dogma. <laughs> okay, bas- okay, basically, like, spoilers for anyone that's going to be watching. The thing is, it's, um, it's there's, there's been cuts on it, so and you can tell that there's been cuts on it, but it's it's still really good. Okay, so basically, uh, a dragon dragon comes down to really... I'm not oh, I'm very close to swing there. comes down to a really developed fishing village. Um... Ruins some things, kills some people. <laughs> this why is this? You're like, trying so hard to watch words. <laughs> kills some people, and then it, the the soldiers go away. <laughs> <laughs> so you pick up a sword and fight the dragon, and the dragon knocks your teeth in, and you then and you and then he rips out some Latin to you. And then he takes your heart and he goes off. So then you wake up and then you go and then you're in the room. Die and you have to get your heart back for some reason because immortality is not apparently that great. Who knew? Um, so then you go on this big adventure and you get some politics involved and whatnot. The thing is, a lot of it is still undeveloped and you can tell that it's been undeveloped. So you've got things that lead on to other things, but some of times it, uh, some of the stuff isn't as big as it should be or isn't as developed as it should be. And you can tell that some parts have kind of been rushed a little bit. As in, like, you start having a fling with the Duke's love, uh, with the Duke's current spouse, also your love, in- love interest, instead of it ending in a certain way, Instead, he basically locks her in his dungeon, the mezzanine, whatever it, it, whatever it is called. And so then you go and save her, and then she goes back to her home country, as you do. But yeah, you kill the dragon, and then the world go, gets plunged into hell. And there's all horrible monsters all over the place, and it's pitch black all the time. And then a sinkhole appears, and you jump in the sinkhole, and it, there's portals above it and at the bottom of it. So you can keep falling forever, and it's called the Everfall. Where hey, because you're falling, <laughs> um, and with this you're supposed to kill thing, take st- uh, magical stones, and with this open, uh, open, light a brazier and open up a portal into heaven. And with this, you basically meet God, who is the reason at the start of the game, and then after kicking in God's. After giving God the business, you basically become new gods, but you get a God's Bane Blade, so you kill yourself, and then the game ends. And there's a bunch of other endings as well. One of them is that you actually fail and you end up becoming the dragon. So the dragons are basically arisens that failed to have this. But the reason all for it is that the world is fueled by willpower. 
so God basically becomes the engine to fuel like the the God's willpower fuels the world basically and when you become God you can't really do much just in one or two areas and you are invisible and that's it basically <laughs> What about well the necromancy or the undead order? Uh, when it comes to the necromancy, you get one spell, and sorcerers can. I'm not sure if mages can get it, played mage because um, I'm not having I'm not having my NPC uh, party doing things without without me attacking stuff. It's very. Cl- oh, we lost it. Close there, very close, nearly. I think there's a there's a spell there's a spell called necromancy uh, necromancy in high necromancy. It's basically, uh, schools like spiritual school. The scores float towards enemies and explode, and if the enemies are light enough, it will lift them into the sky, I think, and explode and drop them. Um, that's pretty nice. But when it comes to the undead, the undead come out at night because they die during the day, and at night, everything gets a lot more difficult. So at night, everything, everybody goes home, everybody locks in their cities, all of that stuff, because nobody wants to come out at night, because that's when the undead come out. Z- zombies rise from the pardon me. Zombies rise from the ground. Liches p- uh, patrol the, the area. You can see ghosts and spectres and spirits in the distance. And you can actually see them floating around and all bright like orbs and whatnot. It becomes very spooky and very eerie, and the difficulty ramps up a fair bit. The thing is, though, is that because of how the leveling is and because of how the undead are, it doesn't get as difficult as it should. The actual difficulty with Undead comes from the DLC, Bitter Black Isle, wherein you're going into this dungeon, which has basically got the same layout, but it gets more twisted and darker every time you get deeper. And you've got Undead in that, that if you're not careful, will ruin your day. You've got you've got giant bloated undead like uh, un, undead in Dragon's Dogma are really really tanky, right? They're really 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 tanky. Some of them are so tanky that you could be attacking them for a straight hour and they will still be alive and kicking. You have undead that will lie in wait, uh, dead on the ground, and they will grab you and whatnot, and then they'll start screaming and what and stuff like that. You will have uh, you've got uh, wolves that will eat corpses, like everything that you kill on Bit of Black Isle um, can attract monsters, more powerful monsters to come and eat them, and that you can fight. And these are basically necrophagus uh, ones that they're attracted by the scent of death. So you'll get big wolves that will eat the king flesh. You'll get uh, zombie dragons and whatnot coming, like cursed dragons that will come in, and you've got to kill that. Are, that have got different uh, ways of fighting them than normal dragons, slightly. So it's so it's pretty good, honestly. You even fight death. Well, that's I don't really know how you can win that fight, but all right. Well, that's that's funny because they actually go an interesting way about it. Because bosses in Dragon's Dogma have health bars, so it's like you'll have like the the, the, the really higher ones will have like eleven health bars to, for you to get through. And when you when you kill, it's got like uh, orbs, like circles underneath its health bar. And every time you the health bar goes down, one of these orbs will break to signify that you've taken one down, and you got to go for the rest. But the way that death works is death will uh, death randomly will appear around the map and is attracted by the send of death. So, but he has a high. Ch- I think it's the case where he will always spawn in this one area. It's kind of like an introductory kind of um, <sighs> bugger you, <laughs> you, bugger you, as in, as in, as in, um, as in hey you, I'm going to ruin your day. So okay. To what kind of stuff you're going to be in? But he's got. He's only got two, uh, two or three attacks. I think. So he carries a lamp, uh, a lantern thing with him, and with it he can he makes you fall to sleep, and then with his next attack it instantly kills anything and everything. So he raises his scythe, and when he swings with it, it will one shot you, your party, uh, bosses, mobs, anything that gets hit with it dies. The thing is though, when other creatures accidentally kill other creatures, you gain the XP. When some falls to its death, you gain the XP. When death kills something, you do not get the XP. So death basically cooks you out of, out of stuff. And his health is basically um, all over the place. Um, as in... So you do... You take one health bar down on your first encounter. The next time you encounter him, his hail... His... That's how he works. So okay. you don't you don't take it all down in well you you well people will basically take it all down in one go because people will build themselves to be mental but um, the idea is that you don't t- fight him in one encounter you can fight him in multiple encounters and he's going to be really really difficult to do. Oh, interesting okay. mechanics. Mm. I think that there was a thing that you could do wherein because he floats over on one part of the map he 
this uh, abyss where you die for falling into it. And there's a thing you could do with explosive arrows where you basically knock him down into the abyss, which kills him. So you gain the XP, but none of the items, and you get the achievement and everything. So it's like, ah, okay then. <laughs> you could be the embodiment of death. But, yeah, you, just, but you cannot defeat video game fall damage mechanics. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. It's like, oh, I've, uh, it turns out that death is... Uh, awesome. Okay, then. Let's move on to the next topic. That sounds pretty interesting. Magic, though, what, was it MCG Undead? Um, or was it something else? Did we decide on anything? I don't think. Uh, maybe we could focus on more of the narrative ones, more of the book depictions so i can tell you about one if you want go ahead i've got one as well you go first okay so there's these books called the well the first one is called sabriel and they're basically the the abhorson books and it's basically about good necromancers and they have these various different bells that they can use and like each bell has like a different effect on undead like one of the one of the bells will like send them fleeing other bells will like uh destroy them but it's, there's always like a danger because if you misuse these bells then terrible things happen to you i think like the, the bells and everything is is cool but i don't like it because the good necromancers make no use of minions at all only the bad necromancers do so so, so they're not them. necromancers then. Yeah, basically. So I think it's so like a it, shitty depiction for that reason. It's it's, it's a, a a book with necromancy involved about necromancers fighting necromancers where one of them are not necromancers. Basically, yeah. And that's my contention uh, with it. Like I I just uh, they might as well have just called them something else, like spirit weavers or yeah. Oh God knows. I think I that I have not heard of it. I think that if you're going to depict necromancers that try to be morally good, you have to include minions at some point because that's just what makes a necromancer. Yeah. But uh, I think that it's it's something that I have to go very deep into to try and talk about it. But like, it, like say you have two groups of necromancers that both use minions, but the good necromancers use ones that don't, aren't powered by souls, and the evil ones are ones that are powered by souls. Things like that. Ugh. Seems silly. Yeah, I, I agree. Do you want to do your one, and now we'll, and then after that, we'll we'll let Ghost talk again. Sure. Um, well, one that I like to. Well, I, it, there's not a lot of narrative books that I tend to read now, but one, of course, I love uh, reading all about is, of course, the SCP Foundation. Mm. Um, I don't know. How familiar are you with the SCP Foundation, Jeb? I don't know anything about it. Oh, oh you're missing out. Oh, it's got oh. some incredibly good stuff. Oh, so uh, I'm going to have to send you some links and recommend you some things after this. But uh, essentially, um, the best, like, to understand what SCP is, it's essentially just uh, an organization that grabs and ho- like basically keeps in giant prisons uh, supernatural and strange objects. Even though it's based in the modern day, but it's it's and it's it's quite something. But I'll, I'll that I'll that's a whole other explanation. But in terms of necromancy, there are a few objects called SCP objects, uh, which are directly to do with necromancy. Um, there, well, necromancy and death. There is one which is a certain concept of death, uh, which is basically a horrible afterlife. That if someone knows about it, that will then become their afterlife. Oh, and, so, oh, is it the cognito? Uh, uh, wait, which one's that one? The cognito hazard, which has the uh, the O five go. Uh, essentially crazy over and they have to try and prevent anyone from reading it um, uh, so it's not it's not the one it's not the one wherein um like you can find people f- after going there no 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 the one where you are still conscious when your uh body is um dead and you feel oh. everything oh actually that just reminds me sorry a, a small tangent about uh doctor who they actually directly address this um Death in the Doctor Who universe is 
literally that your body feels everything after you die because there was a horrific episode that was talking about how uh, a certain group of individuals was like stealing people's souls to save them and the reason why it was saving them is because they found out what happens after death which is if you die you are still conscious and you just feel what your body feels and um it came up with the horrific uh realization of they basically use these certain tv sets that let them tune into listening to people in the afterlife and it was just a whole bunch of people screaming don't cremate me don't cremate me which is horribly uh, what about, what about those that are buried and have to deal with their decomposing body yeah um, I think more along the lines of they feel the pain, so when it comes to cremation, they're obviously going to feel being burned alive for the rest of existence. So, And I guess that's kind of what happens in that SCP as well. But, um, get that, just that small tangent. Um, the one in particular I wanted to talk about was 049, which is a plague doctor. Oh, um, that, yeah. There's that one, and then there's also the zombie virus one. Yeah, it's also the zombie virus, yes. The zombie virus is just typical, you know, generic zombie yeah, yeah, virus. Yeah, yeah. 049 is a plague doctor who is obsessed with the concept of the pestilence. Uh, real quick, does 106 count for this? Oh, wait, which one's 106 again? Uh, the old man. Um, I don't really, I wouldn't really say he's undead. He's more like a metaphysical creature rather than undead. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but, I mean, he looks he looks undead mm. um, but yes uh, so 049 is obsessed with something called the pestilence and it, essentially people are half stuck between if he's completely insane or if he's the one that only knows the truth because the pestilence according to him is something that infects most alive people and he can cure them because he is the cure and in order to do so, uh, his he, cure is most effective. Yeah, his cure is most effective because if he touches someone, they die, and if they die, he then works on them doing something, and then the person gets back up as a zombie, and he then claims they are cured of the pestilence, and then the zombie attacks and tries to kill people. Yeah, and they uh, it, the, isn't in the document. Then they have it where in zombies are like. Have- strength and uh, adrenaline and whatnot and they're a bit slow but they're really really strong and hard to take down essentially yes it's it's the there's two essential theories behind it one is that he is completely off his rockers and thus you know is just saying all this because he believes he is correct because he is the cure Mm. and the other one is that he for some reason believes that life is the pestilence and he's curing them by giving undeath to people See, I remember that there was a, an animation that kind of went a bit into uh, his backstory. The thing is, though, is that because of the community nature of SCP, it's hard to know what's actually true, true. Oh, and, everything's um, true. Everything's subjective. Yeah, it's, yeah. That sounds pretty interesting. Oh, mm. absolutely. I uh, definitely have to show you some stuff after this. I've, I've, linked, I've linked a video to it. I would reckon, uh, uh, Chad, would it be all right to... Would it be a thing to put this in the uh, description as well for people interested in the SCP fan- Foundation? Yeah, I can do. I can do that. Cheers. Lovely. Uh, but yeah, basically, it's the SCP Foundation. It's it's um, the gist of it. It's it's a website. It's a fictional um, international organization with powers beyond every government worldwide that basically um, uh, secures, contains, and protects. Um, anonymous, uh, secure anonymous objects, contain them, and protect humanity from them. Anonymous objects being ones with very strange properties that are not natural. Say, for example, a lizard that can't die. And it very nearly got, they very nearly said it then. <laughs> a lizard, a lizard that can't die because it's indestructible, or a mask that possesses people when it takes over them and displays sociopathic tendencies. Or say, for example, literal god. Or a toaster that I uh, that I for some reason cannot help but refer to myself in the first person. Yeah, or a a, a literal that changes its shape to become something useful, but then when it's being used, I think it changes into something completely useless. And the reason as to why this is scary is because under the in the unlikely event, it could uh, become the sun, for example. So it could replace the sun and then become a toaster. 
there's so many different things to do with undead and afterlifes and death and I mm. guess kind of necromancy and the SCP there's Foundation. So, we could there's set- so many interesting ideas and concepts. Like, and there's so many interesting. It's it's not st- uh, stuck to one particular thing either. You've got items, creatures, objects, afterlives, locations, um, concepts, cognito hazards. As in, if you if you know about it, then you're at risk. There's even there's even like alternate history ones or uh, end of the earth events, like there's... one of them, one of them being when day breaks. Ah yes, I think That's... it's mostly the type of thing that you'd have to have an entire podcast dedicated to the necromancy and death mechanics of the SCP Foundation to go over everything because there's a lot how to many, go through. Yeah. How many documents are there now? Because like when I last checked, because I, I remember sort of it was up to a thousand when I was young and I was looking through it, and then I remember checking back. Um, a thousand or two thousand in how many are there now uh just scp documents as in the objects themselves there yeah, is yeah, like scp three, like five, yeah, four, there, yeah there's only they're on the fifth series now so there's over five thousand different ones but of course you've oh, also Christ. got you've got the alternate universes you've got the tales you've got mm-hmm. the stories it's oh there's also the, all of the revised ones as well ah yes yeah like one seven three being revised and basically cloning himself all right um Let's move on to Frankenstein, if everyone's okay with that. Of course. Frankenstein, yeah. I think it's pretty cool. Like, Frankenstein... Frankenstein's monster is, like, the first undead construct in fiction. I feel like Mary Shelley doesn't get enough credit when it comes to her uh, contribution to fiction with with that. Like, she's an absolute mad lad. Absolutely. Like, she's a really interesting person. Um, But with, with... with Frankenstein, it just paved the way for so much more. Because I feel like if if you go if you trace the necromancy back far enough, it will lead back to Frankenstein, which is which is sci-fi. So it's kind of like its own version of sci-fi because just you know, it, 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 talking about those kind of depictions of things were not really. I mean, done before in fiction, mm. and now, and I guess that's kind of what sci-fi is now, talking about things that people in our current times couldn't even imagine happening. The thing I find really interesting as well is that at the time she was, wasn't she with uh, other people, uh, like uh, other people in like a building somewhere, and she was she was writing it then, like she just wrote it in a short period of time. I can't help but imagine like. With with her, with it being about a bloke whose arrogance and sort of god, uh, god complex makes a monster, and that monster goes on to kill other people, for the time period, I can't help but think, you know, it is what what kind of men was she, was she with at the time for that? Because if you look at a lot of necromancers nowadays, it is more or less very similar things. You've got um, people like there's there's a stereotype of a, of an edge lord necromancer being. In basically, oh yeah, I've got a god complex. I've I've got this. I'm so powerful. I'm more powerful than everyone else because I can do this and this and this. It doesn't change a lot. Like it, going back to Frankenstein, you've got similar stuff. Like take Nagash for example. Take Nagash. Take Kemler. Take Gorst. Take um, Kelfazad. Take <laughs> what other ones are there? Because there's a lot. There is a, a Voldemort. Are you basically asking like? Like maybe there was a man in her life that was like like a dick. There much. was her husband. Yeah, her husband was the man who uh, many people believe she based the idea of Doctor Frankenstein on, because he was a rather um, not a con- not controlling, but is in the reason like the 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 building she was involved in when people were uh, basically. It, she was thinking she was doing it. Of it. Yes, yeah. she was. She was at essentially a writer's <laughs> convention. Retreat. Yeah, she was. She was in a place where writers were going to talk with each other about different things, and was at a party. And as part of this, she started talking with the guests, and then the guests that were there, she started talking about her ideas, and then from there, her concept of Frankenstein built up from there. But her husband is generally the man that they consider to be who dr frankenstein was based off even though their relationship i believe was quite complicated i was gonna say because did she carry his heart like his calcified heart around in like poem paper or some very very nearly swollen um yeah didn't she carry his heart around with her at all times or i don't know but if so she is definitely a necromancer (laughs) she's she's certainly an interesting character 
All right, guys. Um, Jinx needs to go, which is fair enough. We've had mm-hmm. a very long podcast this time, two hours and ten minutes. Oh, it's 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 content it's content for your patrons and loyal watchers. Yeah. <laughs> and we did the fans for their dedication. Yeah. And we didn't even do like half of the list, or maybe just half of it. So Sounds that- like a part two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> part two, five hours late. And here I was thinking I'd run out of stuff early. Nope. <laughs> So, um, I didn't. I, I didn't even swear either. Yeah, yeah not at all. Oh, I'm so tempted to, but you know, thankful. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh... All right, guys. Any closing statements or anything? Fuck my life. <laughs> oh, fuck Guild Wars Two. Forty nine. <laughs> yeah, fuck. Oh, shit. Life. Cheers for having us, mate. Cheers for having us. No problem. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's fun.